Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Q4 2023 system demo. So I'm Jean-Michel Becker, the head of a portfolio management office here in uh, the EMA, and I will be your host uh, for the whole morning. And let's go through some housekeeping first. Um, first of all, the, this session is being recorded. It's a uh, live broadcast on YouTube. The um, a link can be found in on the AMA corporate website. And I welcome and I encourage you to socialize and to publicize that link. So to make sure all um, uh, people interested in what is going on in the agency in terms of uh, digital product development, uh, they can be aware of. At certain point, we will also have uh, an interaction through uh, Slido. And uh, of course, it's voluntary. And according to our uh, privacy uh, data privacy statement, uh, if you if you choose to use a Slido um, and not anonymous, so if you enter your name, you consent to the processing of your personal data, and that's something uh, part of uh, our uh, policy to make you aware of that. So let's go through of what exactly a system demo. So the system demo is really what happened in the last three months, as you may be aware now, as you know, we are working on the quarterly basis. So we are doing um, a planning increment at the beginning of a quarter to plan in detail uh, what needs to, to be developed and to be introduced in our products. And three months later at the system demo, we see what happened um, to, to that plan so we can follow up the, the progress of the products. Um, it's very um, important to note that's not a, a full product uh, showcase or a full product uh, webinar as we can have uh, uh, per product. It's really what happened in the last three months. It's really the features which has been uh, uh, developed and we encourage, and it's the right time to give uh, for you to give your feedback on the features which has been incorporated in the last three months. The next system demo will be the 26th of March uh, 2024. So I invite you to mark uh, in your calendar that date, and uh, if you want to see the next uh, the next three months um, developments. So the agenda for today is quite uh, it's quite busy. We have made more and more products uh, coming into our new way of working, and we are very happy uh, of that. Um, the goal of that agenda is really to have um, the timing of each product. So people interested in a particular product don't have to sit uh, the whole uh, system demo because that can be long. I think we have an agenda until two o'clock uh, this afternoon. So we will have to, to stick to the timing and I may have to, to cut the presenter. Sorry if I have to do so, but because we really need to, to be on time um, to make sure people can follow uh, the product they're interested in. So how to give uh, feedback and questions? Uh, of course, we will use Slido and you will have two ways um, to give you your feedback. So you can see the, the barcode, so you can go and already open uh, your Slido um, on, your, on your laptop or desktop. Um, there is no password, so it's easy to access. Uh, you will see on the hand right uh, side of a list of room. So each product have its own room. So we invite you to, to, to choose the right room to give uh, your feedback. So it will be easier for our teams to, to follow up. And you have two, two kinds of uh, feedback you can give. You have a Q&A, which will be uh, uh, public, and the answer will be public. We will try to answer as many as we can uh, questions uh, from that uh, Q&A, but it will depend on the time we have. We usually publish those uh, uh, question and answer afterwards, uh, the time we collect the answer from the product owner and we publish on our website with a system demo uh, event page. 
And if you want your feedback to be not to be public, so it's between you and us, <laughs> uh, you can choose the poll. So on the Slido, you have uh, the option to choose either poll or Q&A. Q&A, so will be public and will show up uh, on the on the public site where the uh, poll will be only for us and uh, it will be integrated in the FAQ uh, document if we see if we can go public with that feedback. So I hope this is clear. And uh, let's go forward uh, to the system demo as uh, as we we need to move forward. So the first um, demo will happen in the value stream managing the agency. This is where we find all the products uh, supporting the operations of the agency and supporting the core business also of the agency. And the first product uh, we will uh, demo will be the EU Network Training Center Engagement Portal. So it's a, it's a portal. And Marianne will show us uh, what they have been uh, doing the last three months. Over to you, Marianne. Thank you very much, Jean-Michel. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can, Marianne. Please go ahead. So my name is Marianne Vaniers. I am, as mentioned here, the product owner for the UNDC Engagement Portal. And Emily, could I have the next slide, please? Just to introduce um, what we do at the EU Network Training Center. So it is a joint EMA HMA, so Heads of Medicines Agencies activity that was started in 2014 with the aim of offering training opportunities to the staff in the NCA, so the staff of the medicines regulatory authorities in the member states. Um, over the years, we have built a catalog of training offers for these colleagues, and they are on scientific regulatory topics mainly, and we have expanded our scope also to data related topics. So we have an offering for the colleagues in the network, which we make available through a learning management system. So it's a digital platform where the online training can be accessed immediately and where you can register for instructor led or face to face trainings. Over the years, we have been uh, we've, we've, there are some issues with the, the, the LMS as it is. Mainly, there is no public information anywhere on the UNTC. It's only contained within the LMS for which you need an account. There is not a lot of visibility of what we offer in the catalog unless you can get into the LMS. You can, there's no way that you can publicly see the catalog. And there was also um, issues with finding the right link and finding the right information on how to get access to the system if you're entitled to access. Could I have the next slide, please, Emily? So for RPI objectives for this increment, we, we basically started the development. Um, so we had selected technology at the start, but we had still put the full agile team in place. We had to do the development roadmap, um, work on the APIs that could give the view of our catalog on the portal. And um, we would then build and deploy the portal. Um, we currently have, I will demo the portal as it is. We will do a soft launch this month, and then we will communicate on the availability of the system at the start of next month. And that's why, uh, so our change management is still to be executed at the start of, sorry, at the start of next year, which is also the same as the start of next month, actually. So, um, with this, I will now share my screen and um, show you the portal and what we have developed. Can you see my screen? Yes, now we can, uh, Marianne. Please go ahead. Thank you. You can see everything. All right, very good. Um, so, as you can see, we are here at the home page of the portal. Um, immediately, you can see information about how to and who can access the courses, the link to the system if you have the right credentials, and also information about how our NCA colleagues can set up a new account, noting that EMA staff has automatic access to the catalog. There's some quick, it's very simple, there's some quick links on the page. Sorry, I'll close this. Um, um, and just a very short introduction. The main functionality, of course, as mentioned, is to give a view of our catalog of offers, and this can be done on the training for the network page. Um, as you can see, 
you can search. So the, the catalog is displayed here. Uh, we have about 378 items in the catalog. Um, and at the top of the page, you can see there is a search box. So, for example, I can search by keyword. We'll try to type in um, a topic. So, in this case, I'll just search for iris. I'm just being a bit slow at the moment. I'm not so sure what's going on. Let me try and access it again. So we're still in the testing environment at the moment. I think it's it's being very slow. It definitely did work this morning, but I will show you how from the from the results that we can see, um, we can see that you can get get a full overview in a tile setting. You can change the view as well to a list setting. Um, that gives you a bit more of a clearer overview. Um, you can search the entire catalog to quick links, so the subject areas are, so there's some quick uh, uh, subject areas that you can find here, but there is a full list of subject areas that you can select from. So for example, I'll try to select here inspections as a topic, and you'll see all the offers that we have available under the subject area inspections. Um, you could also obviously go to the details of one of the courses that you see, um, and find more information. Um, again, I think the system is being very slow, so let me try and let me try and um, give you an example. Um, so apologies for this. Let me try this again. So we go from inspections. And then we can search for the different types of courses that we can find under the subject area of inspection. So we can select not just um, the subject area, but also the delivery method. So we have both online and face-to-face -face training offers. So for example, you'll be able to select the, the offer that you are most interested in. Um, there is an issue with these dropdowns that is a bug that we are fixing, um, hopefully, um, before we go live. So here we go. So you can see you can select between online courses and instructor-led courses. You can also see the difference based on the little icons displayed. And then for any of the courses that you see, you can go in the details. You can see some information about the topics, the learning objectives of the course, the duration, and contact person. And then you can see the direct links to access the course um, either as an NCA user or as an EMA user. So by following this link, you get access to the LMS itself from where you can then start the course. Going back to the portal, I would also just like to point out that next to for individual courses, we also have curricula in the EU Network Training Center. So you could um, search not just for individual courses, but you can search the training catalog for curricula once it displays. That is not currently working. So there is definitely a search uh, button here, as you can see now, for curriculum, and that will search the entire catalog, not on individual courses, but on collections of courses. So for us, curricula is a um, is a topic area that has governance next to it, uh, governance related to it that will develop courses within that subject area. So 
colleagues can find further information on the governance of these curricula, on what the scope of these curricula are, um, and what topics are treated within that curriculum. To view the full courses um, available within the curriculum, the users will still have to go to the LMS directly in there. They can find the full overview as well as uh, take the courses. Other than that, this is the main functionality, of course, of our portal is to give that public view of the catalogs. So that was uh, mainly um, under this um, page, but we also do have some information for the public who ends up on the portal is looking for information uh, or training opportunities that they can get access to. So we even that's not within the remit of the EU Network Training Center, but we do give them uh, some pointers as where they can find further training offers uh, throughout the EMA corporate website and also on the EMA YouTube channel. Um, then we also have um, an information about the UNTC. Currently, it's relatively limited, but we do have an overview of what the UNTC does, how it, what the how the governance works, and also who is um, in our training steering group. So who's, who's um, um, in the strategic uh, governance of the of the EU Network Training Center? Um, and I think with that, I have shown everything that we have for the EU Network Training Center portal. So we are um, very keen to launch the, public, uh, the portal and to get um, information and feedback from our stakeholders. But um, as mentioned, um, we will do a soft launch this month and we will communicate on the availability of the portal from next year, early next year on. So I'd be very happy to take any questions. Um, so thank you very much, Marianne, and looking forward to next year and the go live for the final version of the UNTC portal. We have indeed uh, one question, though I think you partly answered to it during the demo. But uh, basically, it's if that portal could be open also to, to be extended to the industry to support their change management or training um, to the EMA portals, yeah, such as PLM, for example, but uh, we have many more uh, training we could offer um, with our new uh, uh, products uh, going live next year, for example. So, yeah, can you answer uh, that for question? Sure. For sure. Um, when it comes to... We make training available to industry, to our stakeholders that are not have, actually have access to the LMS in different ways, of course. So um, we do have other uh, channels, as mentioned as well, during when I showed you the publicly available training. We are also working on giving access to additional target audiences. In the short term, we are looking at international regulators, so regulators of non-EU agencies. Um, when it comes to industry, we don't have any concrete plans yet, so that would be um, subject to further discussion. Um, so nothing in the short term there. So, and I also see a next question here. Shall I just take it? So will the new learning experience be stopped once the UNTC is fully functional? Um, so will users of this existing system get automatic access to the UNTC? So the, the engagement portal, the portal I just showed is public. So everybody has access to that. And then only those target audience that we do service, um, so in this case, uh, staff of the regulatory uh, agencies, they can get access to the system. So in that in that regard, nothing changes. Every can, everybody can see the public face of the um, uh, of the catalog, and only our target audience who has an account can access the LMS. And if you don't have an account yet, but you're part of our target audience, you can set up an account. So in that regard, nothing changes. We are looking into further integrating the um, LMS with the EMA account, so that there's single sign-on. Um, and once that, that should also happen in the course of, of next year. And we will also communicate on that when we have more information. And that would make the access to the LMS much easier for, for our target audiences. So thank you very much, Marianne, for those answers. And um, I think we have no more questions uh, piling up. So we thank you very much, Marianne, and looking forward to the next year. It will be an exciting year for the UNTC portal. Um, let's go to the next uh, demo, and it will be in the value stream uh, monitoring. And uh, just... To remind you, the value stream monitoring, this is where 
all the digital products are around monitoring the availability and the safety of the medicinal product or medicinal device. Um, and uh, Klaus will show us uh, what they did in the last uh, three months on the critical med medical device shortages uh, uh, system. Over to you, Klaus. Thank you very much, Jean Michel, and good morning, colleagues. Um, it's a real pleasure actually to um, demonstrate the, the progress that we have made. And the next slide actually provides an overview about um, the uh, CMDS, so the Critical Medical Devices Shortages System, high level progress um, that we have done in the last quarter. So um, the, the main objectives were actually the conducting uh, user tests that we have postponed actually to the next quarter. But we have um, very much focused on the finalization of business intelligence functionalities. So this is analyzing the data that we receive, um, implement further improvements of the web form. So there specifically we have, <clears throat> we have uh, implemented function to remove any personal information. And the main activity actually is the implementation of further improvements of the web forms. And this is actually um, the, so the possibility to, for economic operators to submit information um, for categories of critical medical devices on the individual country level. So this was something that has not been implemented before. And I'm very happy to show you actually the system. So the collecting system and also the, for the first time, the uh, business intelligence functionalities. So very briefly on the next slide is, um, and an overview about the different functionalities. So green is actually all the functions um, that have been completed. So you see that um, for on the collection part, NCA um, shortage submission form, and, and not only the shortage submission form, but all submissions um, of data that is um, detailed in the art in, in, in the regulation 2022 123 um, are available. So NCAs, notified bodies, and also economic operators. Um, we have also finalized the economic operators singles point of contact registration functionality and this was demoed actually in a in a in a, in a previous um, public system demo um, evaluation and management of shortages and also the analysis and reporting so um, and there potentially the matching of supply and demand information and this is something we're going to demo um, later in this um, in this um, um, demo so the next slide Gives you just an overview about so a high level overview about the the, um, the the different functionalities. So on the left hand side, we do see actually the the input uh, modules. So from economic op relevant economic operators, national competent authorities, from notified bodies. So all of these um, functionalities have been completed. So the minimum viable product was completed on uh, in July 2023. And there we see also then actually the reporting functionalities, the data analysis functionalities, also there the MVP has been completed. But of course, we are further in, in, in the agile um, way of working. We are further improving all the functionalities and streamlining um, the functionalities. So it's it's so so basically the entire system is based on functionalities related to user registration and login. So the data collection platform. This is the module that we have now modified for relevant economic operators. Data warehousing and analytics. That's the part that we're going to show um, also today. And integration of other data sources. Um, for example, Udemy once it becomes fully available. Um, so the next slide um, just gives a high level business priorities actually for the next quarter. So for Q1 2024. So now we have actually um, um, we have actually um, um, uh, in, in terms of the data analytical part, we have um, the availability um, or the possibility to provide the data, but this is not um, on, on, the, on the data collection platform. But currently now um, there is only the possibility to analyze aggregated value, uh, aggregated data. So this needs to be implemented and this is planned for the first sprints actually already in Q1 2024. So this is the data analytics part, implement improvements of the data and analysis functionalities. Further, we are working on knowledge transfer and um, supporting actually um, or modifying the, the web forms as well. So here we are planning three um, 
um, small improvements actually of the economic operators web form and I will also show you what these improvements will be and then actually we are, have a, a number of unplanned objectives um, for example implement improvements on the data analytics dashboard that we have actually identified in the previous UAT findings and this is actually for example displaying the reporting period but also the forecasting period and with this actually um, I would like to go into the system and show you basically um, the functionalities. So I will share my screen with you. Um, <clears throat> and we do have um, two different functionalities today. Um, the, the data collection part, and now you could hopefully... Yeah, I hope you can see my screen. Can oh, you please good, confirm? Uh, Klaus. Thank you so much. Go ahead, thank you. Um, Thank you so much. So basically, let's start with the um, data collection platform, and I'm going to show you actually what improvements we have made. And we are absolutely happy actually for any feedback, any comments that you could provide um, to us on this part, and also very important for us actually to receive the information on the data analytical part, because this is something that we're going to focus on um, to, to further improve, to further kind of validate the system. So every single um, comment that we will receive actually will be highly appreciated. So just very briefly going into the Santa Data Collection Platform, and uh, just as a, as a short reminder, the system is only available during public health emergencies. So and it's, it is only restricted to the categories of critical medical devices that are actually listed in the list of critical medical devices on the public health emergency critical devices list um, that has been that has been adopted by the MDSSG, so the Medical Devices Shortages Steering Group. So only during public health emergencies will this data be collected and also it will only be accessible actually um, for the relevant economic operators, national competent authorities and, um, and notified bodies um, during a, a public health emergency. So just very briefly actually, so this is the, the data collection platform and this is actually the, the functionalities for economic operators. I'm logged in actually here with my test user account, so test user web form. So I do see the EU login um, detail here. And um, I, this is basically the platform or the, the functionality where all my previous dossiers that are currently still in a, in a, in a drafting state are located. Um, so what we're going to do is now we're going to create a new dossier. Um, and within the new dossier, we will I will um, show you the, the different functionalities that we have done. So economic operators, um, I'm going to select actually the role. I'm logging in now as a manufacturer. I can provide the information and um, um, I, I can provide the, the um, information. Sorry, there is. Uh... My apologies, I just need to. My apologies, I just need to go back actually and select this again. Um, probably there was a timeout. So I'm going to create a new dossier. I'm going to select the manufacturer role. I'm currently available to, um, to, to provide the information. And actually, this opens now actually the possibility to select a new category of critical medical devices. So just as a short reminder, the critical medical devices are published uh, in the list of uh, public health emergency critical devices list. So here I'm going to select actually the category for which I will, um, I will um, uh, specify the information or provide the information. So these are very generic names here, actually. And what we can see, so device category specification three could be, for example, an infusion pump, or it could be a, a computer tomograph, it could be a syringes. Um, so, but we have used, of course, currently kind of only very generic names. So we do see also actually the allocation to the public health emergency, and we are currently demoing the system under the assumption that there are two public health emergencies ongoing, so public health emergency one and two. And here you can also see actually that some of the devices may be applicable actually for um, one, for, for both public health emergencies. So this could be, for example, gloves or syringes. Um, so I'm just going to use actually device category specification three, which is applicable for public health emergency two. Um, I'm just going to use um, very quickly actually a, a test name. So test manufacturer, you see actually that this is being uh, transferred actually to the header and now going and this is actually absolutely in line with the previous development. So nothing has changed here. 
What has changed actually is the collection of the information either on an EU aggregated level, but also kind of on an individual country level. So basically before all data were, com were, were um, collected on the EU EA aggregated level. So we have some information, for example, risk class of the device intended of the category of critical medical devices intended purpose, specific characteristics that are still collected on the aggregated level. But now actually here is a drop down menu where certain uh, individual countries where the product is made available on the specific market can be selected. So basically here, um, when I click now, I'm just selected the first one in the list, it's Austria. So here now actually information on the shortage um, period, for example, uh, there is an actual shortage potential or resolved shortage can be selected. And, um, if, and, and also, of course, the shortage length um, and, and also information actually on the point in supply chain at which disruption occurs. So this can be selected here on the individual country level and also the root cause of the shortage. I would like to highlight actually these two fields because we concentrated also uh, focused actually in, in our data analysis functionality on the analysis of the shortage information. So I will switch back actually during the next um, during the text um, functionality. So data analytical part um, to this part again. So this information will be collected and before actually we had 11 different fields that are related to um, uh, information, for example, on the um, on the volume of sales, on market share, on available stocks. So this has now been split into two parts. Um, um, seven of them are actually collected on a country specific um, in basis. For example, volume of sales, available stocks, forecast of supply, quantities already delivered. And then actually we also have a new functionality uh, and this is the, the four remaining fields from these 11 actually they are collected still on a, on a, on an eu aggregated level so for example related to product cap uh, capacity supply capacity potential vulnerabilities in the supply chain and shortage and prevention and mitigation plans so very importantly actually exceptions can be can be provided for example in the production capacity there is a limitation which is important for a certain um, country so this information can then be entered here. Um, another functionality that I want to show you, because as mentioned before, so before um, the new implementation of these uh, of these um, uh, of these um, uh, the, the new functionality, actually data could only be um, provided on an EU EEA aggregated level. The possibility is still there, so we have still um, taking into account that many uh, or um, 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 some manufacturers may not be able to detail this information at this stage. So basically, we can go back to, our, to the drop down menu and at the very end of the list, actually, there is the possibility to select. I would like to provide the data for all countries on an aggregated level. So uh, if you if that's going to be selected, uh, a message um, pops up. So, so you selected all EU countries. If you proceed, all data on the previous select, um, selected countries, in our case, it was Austria, will be cleared. So I'm just going to pr um, proceed. And now the information can be provided on the um, entire um, on the entire um, EU EA level. Um, there is a mandatory uh, box now that needs to be provided. So information why is currently not in a position to provide the data on the individual country level needs to be provided. So with this, actually, um, I have shown you the main functionalities that we have implemented in the last quarter. And this allows now really a detailed matching of supply and demand information actually between the information we receive from national competent authorities and also from the uh, relevant economic operators. So if you remember, the diagram showed basically the interplay between the collection of data and the reporting of data. Uh, sorry, the analysis of the data. And this is the main uh, point that I want to show you today. So once you now actually would save and submit the form, actually it will be made available or the data will be in, 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 um, imported basically into our data analytical functionality. And this is basically what I'm going to show you now in the next um, 10 to 11 minutes. <clears throat> so for the for this functionality, we have developed, so for the data analytics part, we have um, uh, focused on the uh, analysis of the shortage information. I already told you that there will be 11 fields actually related to, um, to uh, stock levels, for example, or market share data. This data is currently not analyzed in, in, in completeness. We use some of 
data actually, but more or less um, actually we focused on the analysis of the shortage information point in supply chain at which disruption occurs and root cause of the shortages. So we have developed two different screens. One is the, so we call them currently the shortage view and also the monitoring view. So the monitoring view, I will come back in, in a few minutes. Um, so this will be mainly the part where matching of supply and demand information, but also the information from national competent authorities will be um, displayed. So this screen basically has, has, an, has, a, few, has a few different uh, sections. So first you can select either here or here actually on which um, if you want to go to monitoring or, or to, the, um, to the shortage information screen. So here mainly the information from relevant economic operators are displayed. We have the possibility to select actually um, the, the, the relevant public health emergency. So just as a reminder, so we are currently demoing the system with the possibility uh, with the assumption that there are two public health emergencies ongoing. This can be reduced, of course, to one, or it can be actually expanded to more than one. Um, so we do have actually an overview about how many different medical devices. And just for the ease of use, I'm just going to select all public health emergencies currently. So I can do this with control and left click. So now actually I see the, um, in, in total, four manufacturers provided information. Four of them are actually related outside uh, or actually um, located outside of the EU. So this is then information that we have received uh, in this hypothetical case um, from um, authorized representatives. And actually one of the economic operators has not provided information. So um, there is in the beginning of the, of the web form, um, the economic operator can choose actually that at the current stage, uh, there is no possibility to provide this information. For example, there will be delay in data collection, so the data will be um, made uh, will be submitted actually in a, in a week or two. So this information can be provided, and this will not be, of course, included in the analysis, but actually will be provided here in a separate box. So the manufacturer then will be identified, and information is available. So a new functionality that is currently not completely implemented is actually the reporting cycle period um, um, uh, display uh, functionality. So the MDSSG may state, act, um, um, or, uh, uh, may for example, um, uh, uh, um, may for example define that um, every two, one month or every. So unfortunately, we had uh, some uh, technical issues, so I would like to apologize and uh, thanks for bearing with us. Um, unfortunately, Klaus, uh, Klaus has, um, uh, the demo of Klaus has been cut, uh, though there are uh, interesting questions. Maybe, Klaus, if you are online, you have two minutes to answer to some of those questions, and we can uh, try to restart uh, more or less. Um, yeah, absolutely happy. So, um, so very, very briefly, actually, what is the status of availability of the list of categories um, of critical medical devices? Is it already published in RMS today? If so, what is its name? If no, any plan timelines that RMS expose it? So, <clears throat> the the answer is um, is very uh, very straightforward. So, the pub the categories of critical medical devices will be only made available during a public health emergency. So this is being adopted by, so the list of public health emergencies that contains the different categories will be adopted, adopted by, the, by the MDSSG and then made uh, publicly available. So currently there is no category of critical medical devices list, but um, so there is no currently medical devices list. However, we are aligning actually, of course, the categories of critical medical devices with the European medical devices nomenclature list. So these will be, of course, con kind of being um, included um, into the system. So um, that's the answer to the question. I, and I hope this is the answer to the question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Klaus, and thank you. Uh, I apologize to you. We are very sorry. You, we, uh, your demo had to be um, was cut off uh, by a technical glitch. Um, and now let's move on to the next uh, product in the monitoring value stream. Uh, we are back uh, on time with uh, Laura, who will uh, demo the Veterinary Union Pharmacovigilance uh, Database. So for you in order to give feedback for people who just join us. Um, you have uh, two ways to give uh, your feedback. So you can go on Slido with a QR code or with a number shown on the slide. So all the objectives 
we met during the course. Uh, the first objective uh, was related to the duplicate detection tool. So we completed the minimum viable product uh, for the tool with using the Splint uh, algorithm. Then with regards to the EV web, uh, we improved the AER search functionality with additional search criteria and also allowing users to save, store and reuse a search criteria. And this functionality will be the uh, subject of the brief demo that I will provide later on. With regards to manual recoded, we improved the tool and the interface by uh, including suggestions for the mappings. And uh, also in recoded, in recoding, we uh, did a small proof of concept by uh, adding the country of occurrence to recoding. And uh, the proof of concept actually demonstrated that using the country of occurrence uh, will be too complex. So we are going to be using region instead. So it will be done using EEA and non-EEA instead of the current uh, country of occurrence. With regards to product selection, uh, the names were normalized as well, the names of the products to improve product selection for the users. And then moving on to the data warehouse, uh, there was a new dashboard created, which at the moment is accessible for uh, national competent authorities to show sales data and incidence calculation. And um, this information also related to the incidence calculation. Uh, there has been a development to include the information for, to show the information on the public reports, which has already been developed and it will be put in production by the end of January 2024 to fulfill a legislative requirement. Also within the data warehouse, there has been some improvements to the signaling dashboard uh, where we've added pre-calculation for the active uh, substance level to improve performance. With regards to IS, there were some improvements uh, to update the email notifications uh, by including the product and product groups names and also uh, the IRS and CRM interfaces were improved by uh, adding product grouping search on the forms. There have been also some general performance improvements included. Then also there were some business analysis tasks uh, related uh, to the integration of the third country product names from uh, the union product database into the UBHV system. And also an analysis on uh, using a concept of preferred term for the selection of the product short names. Now, if we go to the next slide, please. This slide shows the progress that we have made so far uh, for the, on the Union Pharmacovigilance database. So the items that are shown in gray were completed by January 22, when the system goes live, uh, went live. Uh, the um, items shown in green, such as the draft AR functionality and improvements to rerouting, uh, were completed uh, during the previous quarters of this year, 2023. And 
the items shown in blue are the items that are currently in progress. So all they will be subject to uh, improvements during the following quarters in 2024. So for example, we are currently improving the manual recording tool, uh, the signal management workflow, and we will be including inspection outcomes on the uh, from IRIS into the data warehouse. And uh, there will be further improvements to the bulk export functionality. And if we go to the next slide, please. So in here, I will provide a brief overview of the objectives uh, for UPHV for quarter one, 2024. So we will continue improving, improving the duplicate detection tool and enhancing the search and display of the mapping terms for the manual recording tool to improve performance and accuracy. We will also continue improving the search AR functionality filtering criteria, which I will, which is, as I mentioned before, the subject of the demo today, and further improvements will be done during the next quarter. The duplicate detection splint algorithm will be uh, continue to be refined and also the suggestions uh, related to the manual recording tool by improving uh, the mappings, uh, importing previous mappings done automatically and allowing correction. We will also retrieve the third country product names to, from the UPD to generate new product index to allow the use of these uh, indexes for manual recording. With regards to uh, recording, we will also implement a new recording strategy which will allow interpretation, which is the splitting of uh, product names that have been reported together incorrectly to allow separate mappings for those terms. With regards to the data warehouse, there will be a new dashboard created uh, related to pharmacovigilance inspections. And also we will start working on the visualization of trends in the data warehouse for adverse event reports and further improvements to the signaling dashboard. With regards to IRIS and CRM, um, the system will be improved by inclusion of the date where the variation, uh, a variation related to pharmacovigilance is expected. And also the cases which have already been reviewed will be, uh, there will be a functionality that will allow to mark those cases. And now we, can move on to the actual demo. So I will share my screen. Could you please confirm if you can see my screen? Yeah. No, we can only see, uh, uh, we can still see the presentation. You need to share the application, uh, Laura. Now we can see the Google browser. Thank you. So I will move on with the demonstration. 
So what I'm going to show first are a functionality that has been um, imp uh, implemented on CERT AER to display predefined filters for MCAs and for marketing authorization holders. So firstly, I'm going to show the predefined filters for national competent authorities by signing in the user uh, UAT system using an NCA login. So I am now logged in as a, a national competent authority. So when you go to search AER reports, now the system will display the following filters. The occur country will be pre-selected with the occur country for the count with the country of the national competent authority that is currently logged in the system. The classification will be populated with case report, which allows viewing the latest valid version of our report. And then lastly, the report, the PACH received date will be populated with the day prior to the current date. So all MCAs will be able to, uh, when they log in the system, we will see this information related uh, to their authority. You can, uh, of course, remove the filters, the pre-selected filters by clicking them off and you can include new filters by selecting them from the tool as usual. So what I will do next, I will uh, log in as a, as a marketing authorization holder user and uh, will show the predefined filters for marketing authorization holders. So we'll close the browser and we'll log in as a marketing authorization holder user. So now, I am logged in as a marketing authorization holder user. And if I go to search AER reports, now you can see the default filters for marketing authorization holders. So this is sender, where the organization that sent the adverse event report is not the organization that is logging and then marketing authorization holder is the actual organization that is logged in. So this allows marketing authorization holders to find cases for their products, but they which they have not sent to the system to allow downloading on of these cases and uh, saving into their system. And as per the, the date filter is as shown before, is the previous date. And also the classification is case report. So this will allow marketing authorization holders to download cases for their products that they have not sent to the system. Then for, I will log off and I will go to the production system to show the last functionality that I want to demo, which is the saving of the filtering criteria and reducing criteria that has been previously uh, stored. So I will close the browser. I will log in again in production and I will reshare.
So now for the last part of the demo, a new functionality has been included, which allows saving and reducing of filtering criteria. So if I recreate the filters, for example, that may be used by a marketing authorization holder, and then I will add some further criteria and save it and then reuse it. So if I select sender not in, and let's use, for example, Swedish Belgium update. So sender is not Swedish. but the marketing authorization holder is so it is. I've mentioned before, this will allow us to view cases related to products where marketing authorization holder is so it is, but so it is did not send them to the system. So Laura, the Laura, Laura, I would like to, yeah, but uh, please can you wrap up because we are moving, uh, we yes, need to, to keep, to stick to the time, sorry, Laura. And then I will finally select product recording date. So the system now allows me to save this filtering criteria by clicking on create new criteria and giving it a, a name. So if I click on accept, this filtering criteria will be saved. Then all uh, members of the organization will be able to retrieve and use this filtering criteria by clicking on use saved criteria, going to select existing filters and finding the criteria that has been previously selected, press accept and they will be able to reuse those filters. So this is it from me. Thank you. And now I will be available for questions. Thank you very much, Laura. Sorry to rush you a little bit. We need no, <laughs> to, to, to keep um, uh, the timing. Um, if we check the question, I think your demo was quite um, clear because there is no questions. And uh, But the questionnaire, the Slido uh, st stays open. So if questions come, on, uh, come in, we will uh, let you know and they will be answered uh, through the uh, corporate website. Thank you very much, Laura. And uh, let's move on to the next uh, value stream. We are coming to the research and development value stream where all the products are around supporting the development of new medicine and generation of scientific evidence. And uh, here we have Paolo, who will uh, show us what happened on the pediatrics procedure on Iris. And for you to be able to give uh, your feedback, please use Slido, like the QR code you have or the number you have. Make sure you choose the right uh, room, so which is the uh, R&D uh, pediatrics. And you have two ways to give your feedback, either the Q&A for your public feedback and will be published and will be public visible, or you can choose the poll to have uh, uh, anonymous and hidden uh, feedback uh, for us. And uh, now, sorry, Paolo, for this uh, small delay, we are trying to catch up. Uh, over to you, uh, Paolo. Thank you, Jean-Michel, and good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to be as fast as possible. So these are the objectives for the fourth quarter uh, 2023. And uh, basically, they were the development of the first three process types uh, listed here at the beginning for the pediatric procedures in Iris. These have been reached. And of course, also uh, the other uh, um, uh, <clears throat> also the other uh, objectives that are listed here. I think this was my only slide. Can we go to the next one? 
uh, yeah, these are the three process types already available in uh, in uh, the, the the industry portal. I will focus my presentation on the industry portal because uh, attendance here is is mainly industry, and I will now share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Yes, yes we can, Paolo. Yeah, Go ahead. Good. Thank you. Yeah, just, just confirming. So the the my objective today is to show you that nothing really has changed. Uh, in that uh, the way you sub you create a submission and then submit it for a, a, a pediatric procedure is very, very similar to uh, uh, what is done currently for scientific advice, orphans, etc. So this is the industry portal. It's also the network portal because as you can see here, there's many, many tabs. I have dual access to the industry and network portal. So industry will see uh, a fewer tabs here and the same is, is valid for the network. But for industry, uh, the uh, usual uh, system applies. Uh, you go to my draft submissions. And normally the system is faster than this. I hope we don't have any more internet problems uh, coming in. Uh, while this is loading the page, I'll show you all the pediatric process types that are listed here. Uh, the initial pediatric investigation plan, the product specific waiver and uh, the transfer have been developed already and the others are ongoing. So now it has loaded the page. Uh, we can create a new submission here and the first step are uh, exactly the same as usual. You first specify whether you're applying as an individual or on behalf of an organization. <clears throat> Both are possible for pediatrics in particular, scientific advice and orphans as well. Once you specify that you apply on behalf of an organization, you have to select the organization and you can see here all those where you have a uh, Sorry, something strange has happened here uh, because this has gone to the uh, uh, production portal. I'm not sure why. So I'll need to redo it again from scratch. Apologies. I'll create the new submission again. on behalf of an organization, and this shows uh, the organizations uh, in the development environment, of course, where I have an affiliation, then you choose the location, and then the submission type, and by typing PED in the search box and then enter, you will see all the submission categories of pediatric procedures. Uh, this is the one we choose for today. Uh, once we click create and next, that's a bit of the slowest uh, part of the system because that's when the system is creating all the background records and everything. And now we have the screen that allows us to add additional managers for this particular submission. So people who can act on behalf of the portal contact, which is the first person, person that creates the submission. And it's always recommended to add at least one, uh, if not two or three additional managers who can see the submission and, and uh, act on behalf of the portal contact if this is necessary. But for the time being, we're not adding anyone. So we're proceeding with the submission type, and as, as you can see, it's uh, very, very similar. Now here uh, you have the, the first choice is to select the RPI or the orphan designation, more about this later, and all the other tabs, as usual, are grayed out and not clickable until the RPI uh, has been selected. Now for pediatrics, there is a slight variation in that it is possible if there is already an orphan designation or an ongoing uh, validated orphan application for the same product, you can select uh, the orphan designation number or the uh, application by clicking yes on here. And then you can see here the various orphan designations for your product, for the products of the same uh, lock ID of the same applicant. Uh, you can select one and in, when this is done, the RPI is automatically uh, retrieved from that orphan designation. And uh, you can save and return, so you don't need to select the RPI directly. This is uh, The idea behind this is that the uh, condition uh, will be copied directly from uh, the orphan designation to this draft submission. It can be changed, but initially it will be copied because if the condition is exactly the same, life is easier for everyone, applicant and us. But this is not mandatory by legislation, so this will be uh, optional. Unfortunately, this, this is a glitch in the system. It doesn't work. I'll show you later how this work, doesn't yet work. 
but uh, the, uh, will be fixed soon. So here we can provide updated information on uh, the RPI. If there is any for the time being, we just click on yes and we confirm that everything is up to date, but it's possible to add enabling technologies and additional information on the RPI. And here we come to the uh, most important part where uh, the, the replacement of the part A form uh, the PDF form for pediatrics in practice, where you select the legal basis and for Article 8, any additional potential triggers for Article 8, um, with the possibility to, to add optional comments in here. Um, then uh, you add an email for public inquiries that will be published on the AMA website, and the same is for the phone number. Optionally, you can add uh, an orphan designation date, uh, orphan designation application date in the future if you plan to submit subsequently an orphan designation, but that's not mandatory. And here you are asked to add uh, any previous advice received, uh, but not from EMA, because if it is from EMA, then we have it linked to the RPI uh, already. We have it in the system, no need to add it. But if it's from the FDA, let's say, then uh, you can add uh, the, F the, the, the advice here. Uh, Let's, or, or Germany, let's say, a national scientific advice. Uh, the advice date is received. Uh, the date is already fixed uh, because uh, the system remembers. Uh, uh, the, of course, the ideal answer here is yes, and optional comments are also possible in here. You can add any number of uh, national advices. And after this uh, procedural information, the scientific information comes up. Uh, actually, it has worked, uh, so probably it's been fixed in real time. So you see that the scope and the proposed medical condition, both in a text format and in a Medra code, have been copied from the orphan designation in here, but you can still edit it and change it if necessary. Uh, one change with the past is that in uh, in Iris, it will be possible only to mention one condition for the PIP. So if a product covers two conditions, that will require two PIPs, which is anyway the recommended approach even now uh, to prevent uh, never-ending PIPs linked to too many conditions. So, so the very, very few PIPs now contain more than one condition, in fact. Uh, you have to then specify the, the uh, treatment uh, uh, indication in adults and in children. That can be different. Either the date of completion of pharmacokinetic studies or a justification, if no date can be provided, has to be added. If you're asking for a waiver, you need to click yes here. Otherwise, it won't um, uh, show the, the tab with the possibility to add the waivers. A date for the completion of the PIP is necessary. And here is where uh, studies and measures are added in a tabular format. Uh, once you select the type of uh, uh, study and measure, uh, you will see that the fields here change depending on, the, on the, the type of study. Comments are always optional. We add a model, just add dummy data here for the purposes of uh, plan date of completion is necessary or a milestone for completion alternatively. And then whether a deferral is requested or not for this particular study and measure. And in fact, if you don't add uh, at least one study measure, uh, the system will not accept. There are Im Im embedded validation rules in here that prevent, if we delete it, for example, and we try to save and return, the system will tell us that the form cannot be submitted because at least one study measure is required. Uh, so for the time being, we just delete everything. We return to the previous screen, and uh, as usual, it's mandatory to compile the full uh, page before it's possible to save. You see that everything has been uh, deleted now from this form because it's necessary to do it completely. Now, quality aspects is probably the um, uh, one of the significant changes with the current Part A form because here we are now requesting applicants to uh, add characteristics of the medicinal product. Uh, before we requested pharmaceutical forms, um, uh, starting from the form, but here we start from existing and future uh, proposed medicinal products. This is not binding information, it's not key elements, but it's uh, uh, just uh, the intention that the developer has uh, regarding the future uh, medicinal products. And they have to be specified as medicinal products are, so with a, with a pharmaceutical form uh, and, uh, and uh, strength. 
then of course once the Melissa flow is created it will be possible to add um, also uh, the roots of administration and the ingredients for this product both active substance and uh, uh, any uh, excipients once everything is completed, we can save and return. But again, you will see that a validation error is triggered because we haven't added a medicinal product information here, which we're not going to do now uh, because uh, we don't have the time in the demo. Submission notes is just a cover letter that you can add here with the generic information. Documents from applicants works in the same way as before. You add files by just uploading them from your folder here, and you can upload more than one file at the same time. <clears throat> Once you have uploaded all the files, you need to confirm uh, that all documents have been uploaded, save and return, and your application is now ready to be submitted. Of course, not all the tabs have the green uh, V uh, to the right of them, which means that the submit application is still black. But once we've completed, we can click here, submit application, and uh, uh, this is it. The submission is done. Uh, uh, so the process is very similar to the current one, but conducted entirely in the Iris portal and much, uh, much quicker. I think my 10 minutes are off, so I will stop now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paolo, for sticking to the time. We just have a quick question for you. I think uh, it will be easy and quick answer. It, the question is about uh, the electronic form. Uh, if they will become obsolete once the submission will be done uh, through IRIS. Uh, I assume we're talking here of the PDF electronic forms, yep. uh, the part A and the, the studies form, and the answer is yes, they will become obsolete. Thank you very much, uh, Paolo, and I think we are catching up uh, the time and we are coming back on track and we are moving to the next uh, product to demo, uh, which will be the real-world metadata catalogs. And uh, here we have Federico who will show us uh, the the product. In the meantime, I remind you how you can give feedback uh, through Slido, either through Q&A for public uh, question and answer or through the poll uh, if you want your question to not to be seen publicly. Uh, <coughs> and of course, you have <coughs> sorry <coughs> to choose the right room. Um, so let's try to to be less uh, stressed, uh, we are back on time, so now I can give uh, the floor to Federico uh, for the real-world metadata catalog. Over to you, Federico. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Michel. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so here today, I'm going to give a little bit of introduction uh, on the current of the catalogs and uh, data structures and studies. Uh, the product is uh, also part of the current work on the big data steering group uh, plan and it aims to improve the data discoverability and accessibility. We mentioned already in the previous uh, system demos that there are two catalogs, the NSEP resource database and the, the EFAS registers, uh, which will be replaced basically uh, and enhanced uh, by a single uh, catalog of the data sources and non-interventional studies. That's how now it's named. The, in this next uh, slide, uh, we also summarize the type of data which are collected in the, in the catalogs. There are basically four uh, main categories, uh, the data sources and studies that we mentioned before, but also the catalog that will capture uh, institutional networks because uh, these entities are actively uh, to enrich the catalog and they are linked to uh, possibly to the data sources and studies that are listed here. And more information is also available on the uh, uh, metadata list document, which is uh, uh, here, and uh, also the good practice for the use of the reward data cap. Uh, in the last session, we also uh, um, described briefly the, the content moderation flow. Uh, in case you want to create a, a, a new record, basically, uh, you need to, to have a, a, a new login account to the European authentication service. Um, any submitted data uh, will then be approved or rejected based on the, the correctness and the completeness of the, uh, of the record by uh, a validator. Uh, EMA has, uh, will have his validator rights and any update to the record and any revision will trigger any notifications to, uh, to the owner of the record. Um, so, 
Uh, last time we showed uh, mostly uh, collaboration requests. Uh, in, a, in the previous demo, we, we showed a bit of content moderation workflow. Uh, for today, we prepare a bit of uh, functionalities uh, from the dashboard. Uh, we are going to review again some uh, uh, collaboration requests, then uh, use the search bar and search functions, and uh, finally start uh, some export of the results. And as a last reminder, we want to uh, inform uh, that the answer uh, database and you, you pass register uh, will also undergo downtime period from the 22nd of January and uh, the 15th of February. So any website that submissions will need to, to be carried out before for the time. And uh, we also inform the, the, the current owners of the records from uh, the answer that you pass register that uh, they can claim the records, uh, so that after they go live, they will have uh, assigned those records uh, automatically. And said that, uh, I will now uh, go through the demo. I'm going to share again my screen. Can you see uh, the catalogs? Page? Yes, we can, uh, um, Federico. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so here's the usual landing page of the catalog. Uh, there's a bit of introduction here about the, 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 the website. Uh, and uh, scrolling down, you can find the four main categories, so the sections that we uh, described before. So we have uh, international studies, data sources, institutions, and networks. Um, you can access the content through uh, these, these links, but uh, if we scroll up, we can also uh, find the same content through these headers um, here on the in this right bar. We also included a, a new section with frequently asked questions uh, in order to guide and provide guidance to editors uh, while submitting their data and mostly to, to respond to any, any general questions about the couple. Now I will go uh, to my dashboard uh, as I'm currently logged in. Um, just a reminder that uh, you need to log in to log in to, to the catalog if you want to submit any data, any any records. Uh, so uh, you need to create a new login account, and then you you can actually edit and create and draft your own record. Here's the, the dashboard we, we showed also the last time. In the previous, we basically have two sections. Uh, in the first one, we have the uh, collaboration request that I'm gonna uh, show uh, more specifically uh, later on. And secondly, from this section, from this uh, bar here uh, onwards, we, we have basically the records that we uh, created, that uh, as editors we, we created, uh, submitted, uh, uh, drafted, I, uh, and I have different uh, entity types, uh, uh, of course, and different uh, moderation states for, for each of the of these records. Uh, this. Um, so, uh, checking again the collaboration requests that uh, are listed here, you can see here uh, some examples uh, of uh, records that um, for which I've been uh, invited to 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 work and to co-edit. Uh, these are uh, the, the, the colleagues and the, uh, the co-editors that uh, invited me to, the, to this collaboration request. And uh, uh, each of these has a, a status. In this case, for instance, for the three, uh, first three, we already accepted the collaboration request, while for the others, the, uh, the request is still pending. We can either accept uh, or decline the, this request. I can show it. Uh, that there is a confirmation that in this case uh, I accepted the collaboration request. And for the other one, for instance, sorry, uh, we we can decline. Uh, and actually, if you press accept, it, uh, you can also always decline. So uh, in this case, we uh, decline the collaboration request. And pretty. Um, um, user friendly and straightforward we can now move on to another functionality to uh, uh, from the, uh, the this high bar from the search and basically 
uh, the search bar is mostly uh, functionality that allows to uh, trigger and to activate a, a search throughout the content of the, of the catalogs. So regardless of the uh, entity type, we can find any record with a term that includes that word in the, uh, in, in the record. For instance, we can uh, uh, look for a, um, a content that includes hepatitis. And after the research uh, has been uh, uh, finalized, we, we have our result. And we can see, for instance, that we have two data sources and two studies. Uh, we can even further uh, refine the, the, the result with, uh, uh, with the type of uh, uh, document uh, that, that we have here. For instance, we want uh, the data source, only the data source results, and we're going to click apply. And then we have only data sources uh, showed in the, in the layout. Uh, you can also see that uh, when you trigger uh, a research based on the, the record type, we also uh, have uh, subfilters uh, which uh, adapt to the kind of content that, which is available on the, on the result. And for instance, uh, I can also uh, further refine the research with uh, if I'm interested only in this is a registry. And I will apply again the research. Now that we have our results, we can also export them in a um, CSV uh, file from this button. And uh, it will appear here in the downloads. And we can also show uh, mostly the, the layout of the, uh, of the export. It basically contains the, the categories that uh, for each of the, uh, the record uh, are available. And of course, in this case, I only have one record, but uh, you can download as many uh, records as you want from, from the results. I think that was it from my side. Uh, so if there are any questions, I'm uh, happy to take them or uh, colleagues. And so over to you, uh, Jean-Michel. Thank you very much, Federico. So let's see if we have a question. So let's put um, the slide online. We... Hello. Um, I think your demo was clear because I don't see any questions for now. So we are back on track. We are nine minutes ahead of the schedule. So I propose everyone to take um, a, a small break. And we are, uh, thank you very much, uh, Federico, for the demo. And I suggest to take a, a break, a technical uh, break. Uh, so we can um, come back at 10.45 sharp for the Scientific Explorer and uh, for Scientific Advice. Thank you very much, everyone, and talk to you in nine minutes. Uh, welcome back, everybody. And we are moving to the next uh, product uh, we, uh, we will demo. So here we are still in the research and development value stream, and we will show you what happened on the Scientific Explorer for Scientific Advice. Uh, Jen was not able to be with us, so we will show you a video. And uh, Ana Luisa and Achilles will be an able to answer your question if you have any question. So for your question, you go to Slido, you choose the room, R&D, uh, Scientific Explorer, and you can choose uh, either Q&A or the poll. The Q&A, your question will be public, and the poll, your question will be hidden from the public. And now, um, I think uh, we can show the video. Yeah. The time we upload the video into WebEx. Good morning, my name is Jane Mosley, and I want to tell you about the Scientific Explorer tool. 
In this presentation, I will give you some facts about Scientific Explorer, what it is, who it's for, and I will show you the interface. I will also give you some information about how AI is involved in this product, uh, how it works in this context, what our risk management considerations were, and give you a small demo of some of the AI extractions. And then I will conclude with the phase of development of the product and the next steps. So Scientific Explorer, what is it and who is it for? Scientific Explorer is an artificial intelligence enabled tool. It is for EU medicines regulators and it will enable fast, easy and precise searching within regulatory procedure documents. As these data are restricted and confidential, this tool is for the medicines regulatory network only. The first version of the tool will focus only on scientific advice letters. To give you some more information about the functionality of Scientific Explorer, for the searching, this will enable searching across many different types of data. So structured data will be available. These are data associated with the procedure in IRIS. Also the unstructured data, the free text from the documents, but also it will search into targeted, categorized information extracted via AI from the unstructured documents. When the user has their set of results, they will also be able to work with these in terms of sharing, exporting, interrogating and viewing the documents. So this tool will support EMA and NCA staff with fast, easy, precise searching for regulatory precedents, and in turn, this will support efficiency, quality and consistency of assessments. So I will show you the interface, um, but first I want to say that uh, data are dummy data and there's no uh, real persons or products shown. So let me switch to the demo. So this is the landing page of Scientific Explorer and there are three options here for searching on the uh, with the basic search on the landing page. The user can search into all text on all fields uh, in one go or they can go straight for searching into the agreed condition or indication or they can go straight for searching by products, uh, products or substance names. So if I search uh, into the all text fields, I immediately get results um, with a set of default uh, uh, columns or information fields available. And I can select the ones I'm interested in. I go straight to those. They will be hyperlinked so the user can go straight to the document. Uh, there are also will be options. There will be options to have additional columns and information displayed and to share and export the results with other authenticated users. We're also building an advanced search uh, function and I'll just should give you an example of what that looks like on the presentation. So going back to the presentation, um, this is what our query builder uh, looks like, will look like. And the application and uh, the user can select different fields such as the application area of advice, uh, which is clinical only and use AI extractions, for example, on their digital therapeutics and uh, type of products uh, equals the ATMP. So this is an example where a user can build a complex query using many different fields to find the information that they're looking for. So I've mentioned AI extractions in Scientific Explorer, so I will just give you some further information. We have extracted information uh, from the documents using AI, and we've done this because we found that there was a need for additional indexing of the unstructured information. And the way we went about it was to construct prompts, uh, which were yes, no questions, or questions to extract particular entries and values such as terms. And so the yes, no questions, for example, does the letter contain questions about conditional marketing authorization? And for the terms extracted, 
we said, please extract the following set of information. What is the comparator? What is the primary endpoint, etc. And with the use of AI, obviously risk management considerations are extremely important. So I just want to emphasize the use case here uh, with the use of AI is that it is an aid to searching and information retrieval and accessible only within the network. It's not being used for any decision making purposes. Uh, we have applied usual and appropriate data protection, data security uh, considerations and the authentication of users. Uh, we have validated the prompts that we have used for in, in the information extractions. And the information is extracted only from the specific source documents and not from outside web sources. Assessors remain very much in the loop uh, for extractions. They will be able to visualize and verify the information that's retrieved. And last but not least, communication and training regarding the strengths and limitations and the role of this AI, uh, of AI in this use case will be very important. I want to emphasize that we are not using any public GPT services. Um, we are using similar large language models, but it's all within the EMA secure cloud services and our contracts ensure that the information is retained within the EU and is not used for any training purposes of models. I want to switch uh, to an AI demo now just to show you some of the work that we have done. So this is our experimental environment. It's not the actual AI um, Explorer tool. However, it will uh, help me to show you what we've done and how it works. So if I type in an indication here uh, that I'm looking for that I'm interested in, I have found uh, several letters that uh, re relate to this indication. Now, if I want to use my AI extractions and I'm interested in the primary endpoint, I will click on this and then I can immediately find the information uh, on the primary endpoint for these letters. So, but also some subfields, which are the proposed primary endpoint, what was the level of agreement and the recommendations. Um, I can see it in a table. And then I can also go straight to the letter and verify and visualize the information. Um, and we will also have options to see whether there were questions about statistical analysis, for example, as a yes, no question. So I will go back to the presentation. And just to conclude, uh, we are still in development and we will continue this and UAT in the next quarter. We will be testing with uh, National Competent Authority users in February 2024 and presenting at committees as well in the same period. We aim to go live with EMA and NCA users with the scientific advice letters in Scientific Explorer in March 2024. And uh, this will be supported with relevant communication and training for users. So that concludes the presentation. It remains for me to acknowledge the contributions of the people involved in this work and the team, and a big thank you to them. And uh, I think their Slido is open for questions. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you very much, Jen. <laughs> Even if it's a remote, we wish her uh, uh, good holidays. Uh, so let's see if we have uh, some questions for Achilles and Anna. Um, we have uh, five minutes, yes. So let's give some time to the people on online to react. For now, we have <clears throat> no questions. So I think it's very interesting to see how AI is getting into our product and how AI will really shape uh, the future of our uh, our business. 
Um, and if uh, that represents the first time we are really uh, using AI, I think Kilias can tell us if we see other use cases um, for AI in our uh, in our products. If you have some insight on that, Achilles or Anna. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Jean Michel. Basically, uh, from our side, we see that uh, we're using um, AI or large language models to extract information from documents. That is one use case. Uh, we've started with scientific advice letters. Um, but after the go live, we're considering also to extend um, uh, this approach to uh, other processes. We have seen in uh, the use of large language models also the possibility to simplify uh, doing search, uh, uh, translating uh, not questions that the users would ask to queries that they can go into the systems. And um, in addition, there is also the, the general purpose use of uh, the AI models that uh, we we, we all know by now, uh, on the other hand, on a secure context. So rather than uh, uh, submitting queries in an open AI uh, or another product uh, uh, in the internet, we have this uh, possibility to make uh, uh, this capability available to our users uh, in the context of VMA documents. And we're going through that now, the security the aspects that we need to put in place. and. Uh, the data protection uh, considerations that we need to fulfill in order to comply with the, 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 the EU DPR, the version of the GDPR that applies to uh, EU agencies. So there are plenty of uh, uh, say possibilities to, to use AI and uh, in our work. And But the main thing that we need to keep uh, always in mind is that the information is secured, that uh, uh, information uh, is not exposed externally, and that uh, we we follow the let's say the security context uh, that uh, we have to to put in place in order to to make sure that the information stays stays within uh, the boundaries that uh, set for the the agents. I don't know if Jamisel. Uh, the answer is clear, or maybe you need any clarification or any follow up. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Achilles. No, it's very interesting to see how big AI will uh, come in 2024, I think, in our uh, portfolio of products. So thank you very much for this demo and this answer. And now we are moving uh, to TRIP. Um, as usual, uh, so I, we are with. So TRIP. So TRIP is our uh, product to do horizon scanning and Ralph will uh, present what has been achieved in the past uh, quarter. And if you have questions, please uh, use uh, the Slido and uh, the poll if you want your question to be hidden or the Q&A if you want your question to be public and to choose the correct room uh, to match uh, the right product. On this note, I will uh, give the floor to Ralph. Thank you, Ralph. And thank you very much, Jean-Michel. Thank you very much all to you for tuning in today. It's a great pleasure, and it's the first time that we are having a public demo uh, on TRIP for horizon scanning and for regulatory science research. My name is Ralph Hirold, and I'm a senior scientific officer in the Task Force Regulatory Science and Innovation but I'm also heading the work stream regulatory science and academia. And let me start by saying why it's important to do horizon scanning and look into regulatory science research for us at the European Medicines Agency. We want to prepare for the future in a systematic way. We don't know exactly what is coming, but there are medicine, substances, enabling technologies and research methodologies, and also of course devices, for which it's important for us to understand what are challenges in terms of regulatory science? What are scientific challenges? What are technical and implementation challenges that come with these changes and these innovations? And in particular, of course, we are also interested in finding opportunities where we can foster and support the accelerated development for these 
uh, to new technologies. Uh, and the motivation for TRIP was to do this horizon scanning and regulatory science research, scouting in a systematic way, and in particular to be better able to identify previously unknown challenges and track those challenges that are not yet resolved. Let's go to the next slide, please. This business case that I've just explained is based on our regulatory science strategy that I trust that many are familiar with. It includes to build horizon scanning capacity and also the collaboration on horizon scanning with the European Medicines Regulatory Network, so the national competent authorities, but also going beyond uh, the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities, the ICMRA. And there is also an element of collaborating uh, with academia on horizon scanning and, of course, on innovating regulatory science. So this was the starting point, and this is where we have then thought about that we need a tool that helps us with the process. Next slide, please. In our latest publication on horizon scanning and regulatory science research, we have this figure on the left hand side, and this figure shows the two complementary challenges and public health opportunities. We have collaborated with various organizations on a top-down approach by asking topic leaders to identify signals. And we have also worked uh, experimenting with the bottom-up approach to look at literature in order to identify emerging signals from topics that are increasingly coming up in uh, publications. So this leads to signals. And I want to clarify here that the signals in the context of TRIP are a broader biomedical concept or a technology uh, that we can identify using labels that come from established ontologies. And the signal is important for us because we can assess how the signal, when it comes to the European Medicines Regulation Network, how that signal could impact our ability to support it or to assess it, such as in terms of, can we still assess efficacy uh, of that technology uh, underpinning a medicine development, for example. Uh, I will show this in detail in the app in a moment, but I want to clarify this terminology. Now, the signal is a collection of um, topics that are on the watch list, if you want. Uh, and we currently have some 80 topics that we are uh, keeping a watch on. For each of the signals, we are looking for publications and information from external sources that underpin such a signal, and we annotate uh, such uh, pieces of information with additional labels to make links between the pieces of information and the signals. So this is why in TRIP we have a system for creating annotations, and we put these annotations to information items. This can be abstracts or publications, um, and they all come from sources. And this is the important feature of TRIP. TRIP every night ingests from the sources new information items that we are then curating uh, together. At this slide, I also want to explain that TRIP stands for Topics, Relationships, Info Items and Impact Assessment, and Proposal Generating, because it is about these proposals, how to prepare for the advent of these challenges that we want to use TRIP for in getting better and being more systematic. So on the next slide, please. The benefits follow from what I've just explained in methodology. We will use TRIP to deepen the collaboration between the EMA and the network of medicines regulatory authorities in Europe. And this will allow us to better assess these challenges that I've mentioned and opportunities, and also to have better proposals and recommendations how to prepare for them. We will engage colleagues and EMA staff beyond the team that is currently working on it to also track their topics and be aware. So there's a collaboration feature in TRIP that will allow us to engage and uh, shift minds more to the innovation that are forthcoming and the question of how we will be better able to handle them. Given that the methodology in TRIP is implemented in a strong way, we will also increase our efficiency um, avoid duplication of work 
uh, and we will have a more robust uh, assessment since this is also already done collaboratively and doesn't need sharing of document, etc. but it all happens in the app. Next slide, please. The development has started earlier in this year, and I'm very happy that in the program increment quarter four 2023 that we're completing and demoing now, it was possible for us to complete the essential functionality. There is a workspace, we have a collaboration feature, uh, we are automatically ingesting external articles, and we are also um, in the next days uh, getting access to internal EMA data that can be used for cross-checking if the signals also have uh, already been uh, seen in EMA um, regulatory submissions or interactions. Uh, so I'm very happy that uh, just two weeks ago, we had a user acceptance test where a number of uh, EMA uh, scientific officers from across the agency uh, have looked uh, at using TRIP for these purposes. Um, we have consolidated their feedback now and are looking forward to uh, have a go live uh, in the next year. Next slide, please. Here on the time axis, just um, a visualization of our plans this year and recent times. What has happened is that we transferred our watch list of signals into TRIP. We have executed the user acceptance testing and I'm happy that the results were quite positive. We have familiarized through a number of uh, presentations, the network of regulatory authorities and also EMA users with the idea and the concepts of TRIP. And we are looking forward to have a go live for the EMA uh, in early 2024 and be rolling out a trip as a tool to the network um, uh, following quickly thereafter. Trip will not be publicly accessible, uh, but uh, I will come back to that. Uh, the outputs of the horizon scanning and the outputs of the regulatory science strategizing work will, of course, be published. Uh, and some of you may already have seen our reports on genome editing, on artificial intelligence and also the publication that I had on the previous slide, which is an overview on a range of 25 uh, signals. So 24 will be the year of change management where we will be introducing TRIP uh, into uh, the network and, um, and uh, be recommended for being used. Uh, with that, I want to switch over to show you how it looks like and how it is working. I just will open the correct window. I'm now sharing the trip application in Kios, in kiosk mode, so you don't see uh, navigation bars, but this is the starting page of trip and the main navigation items include from the start page to look at the info items that get automatically adjusted to the signals that we are creating and to reports that uh, can be generated from the signals or info items. Since this is the user accept acceptance testing system, we are not seeing the internal data sources that can be accessed, and I think this is appropriate uh, for today's audience as well. The landing page clarifies that TRIP's purpose is to support horizon scanning and regulatory science support, and also um, for as for user information, the hints that we are currently ingesting around uh, 90 journals publications, mostly through the services of PubMed, but there are a number of other publicly accessible information services with appropriately um, yeah, with appropriate terms and conditions that we are including. Uh, and the internal information uh, comes from IRIS scientific advices, uh, uh, the clinical trial information system CITES and UDAS-CT. So the information items get uh, ingested every night and are presented to users in a listing that you can see here. And the main task of the horizon scanners is to have a look at the abstracts and screen them, which ones are relevant or not. For example, I can already perhaps say that uh, this item is not relevant because it is uh, really just a very local activity and I've declared it as non-relevant. It is now curated and it will not be shown anymore. 
However, the natural language processing a scale of mental status evaluation technique is very interesting. I will keep this as relevant and can later come, come back to that uh, to identify um, further uh, interesting parts. Um, I want to uh, search also for a topic that is relevant for one of the signals I already know. Um, and I want um, here to um, find a certain article that um, is very interesting because it refers to living materials, um, one of the technologies that we should watch. And I have now this information item, this publication, um, that abstract is very interesting, but you can see there are so far no labels. It has no keywords and we wouldn't easily find it back. So we are giving it now uh, a label um, so that we can uh, find it back. It's the living material label. And perhaps I should also add tissue engineering. And here you can see that uh, ontologies from MESH and MEDRA and also a regulatory science ontology that we are developing um, is being used. Now I have curated uh, this information item. Uh, and the, as I said, a team is doing this uh, every day for a larger set of information items with then the purpose to build up signals, the topics that we keep a watch on. And here you see some, uh, please ignore the content. This is uh, play data and demo data, but there's at least one signal um, that I would uh, go in, in detail. The signals can be ordered by their impact rating. Every signal, uh, once we open to curate it, can be assessed by standardized criteria. What would be the impact on the regulatory system? And here we have a signal about human biobots and organoids that uh, could be quite impactful um, on certain of these uh, criteria. It is defined, the signal is defined by a number of keywords, uh, and it is possible then to find all the publications that are relevant to this uh, uh, to these keywords so this is how links are created between signals the broader biomedical concepts and technologies and the publications and info items that underlie them i want to finish by saying that we have a reporting facility built in that allows us to make sense of this um, knowledge base that we are accumulating uh, and that um, these reports will be very useful then to be used as a contribution to uh, horizon scanning reports and for streamlining uh, regulatory science research. Uh, with that, I would like to stop and finish the demoing of the TRIP system for horizon scanning and regulatory science research. And I hope that there are some questions. I don't see any yet, but um, please shoot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ralph. So let's see if we have some questions for you. And thank you for being right on time on the dot. Um, and uh, I think your presentation was clear enough. I didn't generate... Um, no, we have uh, no question for you. So you have been really clear of what you have presented, uh, Ralph. And thank you very much for that. And now we have uh, 10 so minutes... We have a 10 minute break uh, before to move on the next uh, value stream. Thank you very much, everyone, and see you in 10 minutes at 11.25 sharp. Okay, and we're back, it's 11.25. Um, I'm just taking over the uh, facilitation indeed for, for this section, also to, um, I give uh, Jean-Michel uh, a, a small break because he is going to be hosting system demos all day because we have our internal one this afternoon um, as well. Um, we are now moving to our next value stream. Huh? So we've already um, we had covered a number this morning and now we're gonna be looking at product lifecycle management. So all the capabilities to manage the authorization and lifecycle of medicinal products and certain medical um, devices. And we're going to start off with Christina Pusari and electronic application forms. Um, over to you, Christina. Thank you, Joris. Um, so today we'll have a um, slightly different system demo. I know you've 
all been waiting very, very keenly to um, hear what we have done and um, to give an update of our timelines and what's going to happen in the next coming months. Um, in our time that we published in October, we explained that we will be um, giving um, um, uh, an update on that in, in December. And now that time has come. So um, here, just to give you, it's a bit of a wordy slide, but uh, it's just to show you uh, what we have done in addition, of course, to all other develop the things that we have developed in the PLM portal EAF. We have demoed most of those in the previous system demo. So talking about add package, clone scope, clone application, a lot of these things that we have been talking about, we've shown them, um, <clears throat> but we haven't been able to demo them in the production environment. And we had uh, some technical uh, changes done to our environments. And due to that, and a deployment freeze that was published, as you know, we always have a deployment freeze just before Christmas. We did not manage to uh, bring these features into production, but I know there's uh, maybe more interest to hear what has happened and what's going to happen next. So um, here um, you see our um, PI objectives for the last quarter, uh, where some of those that I mentioned earlier, but also one of the objectives was to prepare the system for the um, NAPS uh, launch in quarter one. So what we did do, we loaded and tested the PMS data um, into PMS to check for any quality issues. And we tested that PMS data in PLM portal. Unfortunately, we had technical issues that prevented testing it in the EAF application inside PLM portal. However, they were tested in, in the PLM portal other systems. Um, we found a number of bugs in PMS that mainly related to the match and merge of caps. So as you know, we have this uh, match and merge of data from EMA's internal Siamet database and with XEVMPD. We're doing this to make the products IDMP compliant, and we're also doing this splitting of products. So um, I already saw there were some questions in Slido saying that the terms are not exactly corresponding to those in XEVMPD or not exactly corresponding to those in RMS. And this is because currently the products and the packages in EAF, in PLM portal, come directly from this EMA's internal database, Siamet. It was never designed to um, expose the products externally, and it's not, of course, IDMB compliant. <clears throat> Basically, we found some bugs. We need to fix them. We need to make sure that all the caps are in order before we can release these updated products into um, the PLM portal EAF. And we now have this updated plan for next year. So um, in quarter one next year, we will be um, launching all these uh, features that we have developed in the quarter four of this year. And we will also um, um, concentrate a lot of our efforts into consolidation of development activities for all PLM portal products. So this means EAF, PMS and EPI will all be developed by one same service provider. So for PLM portal EAF, this means that there's a change in the technical team who builds the form and keeps the form updated. So this will take quite a lot of efforts from the current uh, technical development team. And it means that we are not able to perhaps deliver as many new features and functionalities during this first first quarter while we're consolidating these uh, development activities to the new provider. Then in quarter two, we are expecting that we have fixed all the technical issues that we have found in, um, in PMS, and we will be able to release the updated caps in EAF. At the same time, there will be a release of caps and naps in the PMS database. Um, here, I really want to emphasize the NAPs will be released in PMS. They will not be available for external users because there is no user interface of PMS at that point. 
But the CAPS will be immediately available in the PLM portal EAF. So this means that the match merge split CAPS will become into the EAF in quarter two, 2024. So as you can here, there is a delay from what we had initially planned. Um, and then we will need to continue um, doing some internal testing and we will need to really seriously work on performance improvements and this will continue happening through the second quarter third quarter and fourth quarter of 2024 and we are currently anticipating that in quarter four 2024 so this is now um, in about a year's time, we will be able to release the NAPs in the PLM portal EAF. But this is provided that the required performance improvements are done. We have found um, while we've been working on the product UI, the PLM portal EAF and the EPI, they are all in the same PLM portal. And once they're uh, there is a sufficient, or let's say, a number of concurrent users, the performance um, does suffer and we do not want to launch the nationally authorized products in the EAF and in the, in the product UI until we are sure that the system can perform solidly and the features are there and um, <clears throat> there are no impacts to the users. And here I also want to give a, a very, very important um, note or, or reminder for our um, quarter two release of the updated NAPs in, um, in the PLM portal EAF. In preparation for this updated CAPS load, we will announce a period, possibly three, possibly four weeks, where we will advise you not to submit in production EAFs that have been filled in in the PLM portal. So during that period, we will strongly recommend the use of the interactive EAF instead of the web-based form. And why I'm asking this is that um, the, the products as a result of this match and merge and split, there will be changes in the names of the products. Almost all products, um, the name will change. There will be changes which packages are under which medicinal product. And this could cause issues if you have uh, if you receive a VSI for validation issues uh, and you need to go and update the form that you have submitted, because at that point the products might have changed. So we want to avoid any delays and any issues during any validation. We will announce when that period of time will be and we will announce when it's over. But of course, that web-based EAF will still remain accessible during that period of time. We're not asking you not to use it. We're just asking you hold submitting any variations into production using those forms from PLM portal. So you can, and of course, submit forms, um, the in interactive EAF PDFs. So um, that's our important news. I believe we should have the timeline slide next. No, it seems that our um, presentation is not fully there. Um, not to worry. Instead, we will move to the demonstration. And um, just to, to clarify, the timeline slide will, of course, be shortly on our PLM portal. Um, website so you will all get more information from there. For now, I want to show you something that we have done. Please bear in mind, this is definitely nothing final. It's just something that I'm quite um, excited and happy to show you all. This is our um, updated, uh, oh, some issue. Yes, Christina, it's grey. You can't. You no, can't we can't. We can't see. Maybe relaunch the. Um, yes, let's see what I can do. The um, the browser. And you can't see. No. Let's try again. <clears throat> Let me try this way. Um, Can you see my yes, screen now, now? Yeah, now it's uh, it's clear. Yes, thank you. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, 
This is um, a draft of an updated PLM portal homepage. So um, when we first went live with PLM portal, of course, we had only one live product in there and that was EAF. And that means that when you currently go into that website, it's a little bit unbalanced. It really looks like it's an EAF portal rather than a PLM portal. And we really wanted to make it more balanced to show that there are three equal products in that portal. It's not an EAF portal. And quite often we hear people calling it EAF portal. Um, please note that there may be still quite some changes. The background image will change. There may be other changes here, but I just wanted to show here, you will have um, tile for each product. So here we have the EAF, we have EPI, and we have the uh, product management service. So the, the, the PMS how it looks before the user has logged in. Of course, there may be slight differences depending on uh, your profile and when you're logged in, but now I will log in and you will see how the screen, um, how the, the new screen looks for logged in user. So here you can see um, for each product, you can go directly into the activity, be it to create a new EAF, create a new EPI, or to um, do an update in the product UI. And then of course you can, you've got the link directly to the guidance here. So, so it really is a more balanced view of, of the three different products in the PLM portal. Um, we don't have a launch date yet, but uh, this is something that will be in say during the first quarter of no next year. So I just wanted to show you so that it doesn't come as a shock. Of course, there will be further communication on this and we'll update all, all our user guides, how this new, new um, website works. But basically all the content that is available there today will be available in future. So just wanted to um, show you that. I shall stop sharing now and we should have a few moments left for any Q&A. Yes, indeed. So let's um, let's get those questions up on the screen. I think you've already been quite uh, quite busy answering some of them, uh, Christina. However, um, let's uh, let's indeed go um, go through them from the top. Most mm -hmm. popular questions. Um, so the uh, the first one is that the organization date is shown incorrectly on PLM with an old version of the organization. A ticket was raised. So one person who raised the ticket has got this issue, but hasn't been resolved yet. Is there an issue with PLM OMS integration? Um, obviously, indeed, this seems to be indeed somebody's specific issue, but it was thumbed up seven times. So it sounds like there's just maybe a few other users that are encountering this as well. So maybe it's it's worth addressing. Uh, Certainly. So indeed, um, we we do acknowledge that there are some intermittent issues occasionally with the integration routine that syncs the products and organizational data. We, we are aware of that for, the, for, for this particular user, I have indeed responded to the ticket, but for anyone else, please um, indeed, if you haven't raised a ticket, um, do so. Sometimes the resolution can, however, take quite some time um, because we need to do a manual fix. It could be also that there's something more, let's say, wrong with the product in OMS, uh, the, the, um, the organization entry in OMS with regards to linking it to the product. So each case has to be manually solved and it may not be very simple. So um, this is not something that is systematically wrong, but it is intimated issue with certain um, unfortunate consequences happening at the same time. Thank you, uh, Christina. So let's see, then we have next one up also with uh, a few upvotes is by when do EMA expect to have the prerequisite functionality for the uh, MVP, the minimum viable product ready for, for the UAT, so that's for testing and for the start for the uh, enforced uh, transition period. Um, I think you've probably addressed this in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in your slides, but maybe there's a little bit more you'd want to say. Yes, unfortunately, the timeline slide wasn't in my presentation. I'm thinking if I should share it very quickly now, um, just to to um, give a super 
brief uh, explanation on on those timelines. Um, just one moment. I hope you can see it. Okay. It's still, it's still that loading. Is, uh, yeah, yeah, we've got the no, is it we loading. Can't. It's gray. No. Oi. Oi. Let me see if I can. Is it still gray? No. Can you now see we've it? Got it. Now we've got it. Yes. Perfect. Oh, I'm back to the slide that I've already shown you. So here. There we go. Yeah. So this is the updated timeline. So in here, this is basically what I wanted to show you um, earlier. So um, here is the updated timeline. As I mentioned, now we're in December. I'm giving you this update on the releases coming next year. The caps will come in quarter two. All NAPs will come in quarter four. Then. I know this may be disappointing, but I'm sure you all understand we need to make sure that the performance of the platform is good enough and we have all the features that we need for the use of NAPS before we can start this uh, transitional period. So you can see here we've um, updated the timeline to say 2025 and beyond. So we we remain very hopeful that either towards the very end of next year or most most likely in the beginning of 2025 we will be able to make an announcement when we are ready to um, start preparing for the user acceptance testing but of course this means that we would have had to um, implement all these performance improvements and release the functionalities that are still missing. And the timeline with regards to the UAT announcement, the confirmation of the transitional period, start date, so forth, has not changed. The timeline when this will happen has changed. But as I mentioned, we will be um, publishing this updated timeline and we will be keeping you informed on the uh, developments. But um, the transitional period is not foreseen to start before 2025. So I hope that answers the question. Yep. I'll stop sharing. Um, I think it does. Thank you, Christina. Um, so I think in the event this material will, I think as, as Christina also indicated, will be uh, published online as well. Uh, so you will have access to, uh, to that content and that, and that timeline. Um, then uh, we have a question from someone who is curious, what is causing the delay in NAPS release in electronic application forms? It was common understanding that once the products are imported in PMS, they are available and ready to be used in the AF. Um, to an extent, maybe that question that answers itself, but let's... Uh... <laughs> yes, so in, in fact, it's not the NAPS themselves at all. As I mentioned, we have some performance related um, issues. And of course, um, this is two pronged. Uh, the more data there is in the portal and more users there are in the portal. Once we release the NAPS in a portal, we can expect that the number of users will, ri will raise in really um, uh, incrementally. So, um, so we cannot um, afford to risk the performance of that portal by releasing the NAPS at this point. And also because of the data quality of the centrally authorized products need to be solved before we can start the data load on the NAPS. So there, there are two issues, but the main issue currently is the performance of the portal. And we know that this is really important uh, for the users. We've heard your feedback and we want to respect that. Thank you, Christina. Um, it's quarter two, so we'll stop the live Q&A. Uh, I'm sure that uh, those online would really appreciate if, uh, if you had a little bit more time, maybe also to answer some of the questions in writing in Slido. Um, in the meantime, we are going to be moving to our, our next demo. Thank you very much, Christina. And for that demo, um, I would like to introduce indeed in turn, uh, Marcos Gomez, and then I believe indeed it will be um, Andre presenting and concluding indeed will be, uh, will be uh, Ver Veronica. Um, so we'll have indeed the full PMS team uh, for, the, for the demo. Go ahead. Uh, and of course, for those of you just joining for PMS, you can um, uh, send us questions through slido.com. You see the code, that the hash code there. You can also use the Q&R with your phone. Uh, make sure to select the correct room in the uh, on the top right hand of your of your screen. 
If you have a private question, one that you do not want to be see addressed publicly, please use the poll function. So that allows you to ask us a question, which we will not answer live, uh, but indeed to, to address. If you do want the question to indeed be part of the general Q&A, use the Q&A function, please. Over to you, Marcus. Okay, thank you, Jerry. So if we can go to the next slide, we have used a similar approach of the um, EAF team. So here we wanted to explain a bit what have uh, we done during this quarter. So what have we done in terms of EMS? We have solved the batch that we had for the initial load of data from XCVMPD into PMS for the UAT environment. And we have also continued solving the bugs that we have for the Delta. So, you know, every time there is an update from XCVMPD, it has to be uh, propagated to PMS. This is what we call the Deltas. We still have a couple of bugs there. So we have continued solving those, um, let's say, issues that we have. And we will have to continue a bit during um, Q1. What we have also done during this quarter, and it has been used for, for example, the API UAT and also the product UI UAT that we will talk about later. We have done the initial load of data from XCVMPD into the UAT environment. We have also implemented the security and access management of the PMS API that has also been used by the, uh, for the Alpha UAT that we have performed with the uh, SMEs um, for PMS. Uh, we will describe a bit later and we will give you a bit of feedback on this UAT that we have performed. But first of all, I would like to give you a bit of the, an update of what we have found, which are the issues that are still pending in PMS. So what we have found is that the initial load bugs that we had um, for this quarter has been solved. Nevertheless, um, from the Iris team, we have received a new business rule, um, which is to keep the package description from Siamet for the centrally authorized products. So, you know, in chapter seven, we have this table where we explain which is the source that is surviving when we have this match and merge. So when we have data from Siamet and data from XCVMPD, there is only one source that is surviving. For some cases is Siamet, for others is XCVMPD. And for the package description, we had the rule to survive the XCVMPD data. Nevertheless, this package description is used by Iris in different processes. So we will need to change this behavior and, and obviously we will need to implement this during Q1. What we have also found is that um, the UAT mappings that we have for substances, organizations, and referentials are not up to date in the UAT environment. And this has caused, let's say, a couple of issues when we were doing the initial load. Because, for example, for organizations, we didn't have all the mappings that we have in production. So as you can see here below, the outdated mappings from OMS that were used during the initial load made us having products without a marketing authorization folder in PMS. Even though those products have an, um, a marketing authorization folder in XCVMPD, as we didn't have the mapping to OMS, uh, as you can see in the image on the left, the marketing authorization folder was migrated as null uh, for other products. And you can see this on the um, right hand side image where the mapping is in OMS. We have the correct ME holder, the location IDs um, propagated into PMS, and we have a holder for this product. So um, that has an issue because, for example, for the centrally authorized products, the match and merge rules are relying on the marketing authorization holder. So if I have a product from Siamet with a marketing authorization holder, I will only match and merge this product from XCVMPD if the MA holder is the same. So if I have a null, because XCVMPD, for example, uh, is not mapped with OMS, I am not able to do that, and therefore I will have a duplicate of this product. Uh, the solution that we have found is that for the next initial load that we have planned um, for Q1, we will use production mappings uh, for SMS, for OMS, and for RMS. This will also allow us to know how the migration will look like when we put all this data into production. Uh, you have a caveat here at the end of the slide. The match and merge rules and uh, the explanation of what the match and merge is can be found in chapter seven of the EUIG that is already available. So if you have any doubt, if, if you want to know what this match and merge is, you can always go to this chapter and check yourself. 
um, for a better understanding. If we go to the next slide, we were talking about the OMS mappings, but we also have exit MPD data quality issues that we have found in UAT. So you know that for CAPS in exit MPD, we have the EU number field and we also have the authorization number field. If there is any discrepancy between these fields, we will have another issue on the match and merge. So the match and merge rules for the centrally authorized products rely on the EU number. So as you can see in these two tables, the first, uh, the one that we have on the left is the product that is currently coming from PM, from Siamet into PMS. So we have this PMS ID with this name, and you can see that the packages, the MA number at packets uh, level is this 219-005-003 or 013. But in XCBMPD, and we don't have the PMS ID yet for this product because we will, check if we can do a match and merge and therefore reuse the PMS ID that we have. We have this product with this name, but the EU number at pack level is always the same and is two is finishing in 219. That means that the match and merge cannot happen because I cannot match the pack sizes or the presentations that I have from Siamet with the presentations that I have from XCVMPD. This means that I will have a duplicate. I will have two products in PMS, the one that I already have from Siamet and the new one that is created from XCVMPD because I'm not able to match and merge um, this product. Um, the solution that we have found for this is that um, XCV, XCVMPD production is being updated by the validation team to correct this data. Moreover, I'm not sure if maybe some QPPVs that are listening to this system demo, um, I have already been contacted some of them so they can update their products. To be honest, they are not a lot of products um, with this situation, but all the QPPVs with a product with this type of issue have been contacted. Some of them have, um, have already made the change. So we will um, solve this issue for the future. Moreover, what we will do as uh, something similar that we will do with the mappings from SMS, OMS, and RMS is to have a copy of XCVMPD production in our lower environment in UAT. So we will have updated data. This again, together with the mappings will allow us to have like, let's say, um, mainly production like uh, initial load, we will be able to see, okay, which are the remaining issues if we need to solve anything. But again, it's useful if the marketing authorization holders can start, start reviewing this data in XVMP. And to do that, I have another slide where I would like to um, make some suggestions. Um, so, no, sorry, the next slide is the one where if we have the correct mapping, uh, sorry, I, we can have the previous one in the previous one is where we have the correct mapping. So the same ME number at pack level in Siamet and in XCVMPD, if they are the same, then I will have a perfect match and merge. And I will only have one medicinal product, the one um, that I had with uh, coming from Siamet, but we'll have updated data from XCVMPD. So as now, yes, in the next slide, we have some suggestions to the marketing authorization holders, some recommendations on what would they, what would be fun, what would be good to do uh, for them in order to check the data that they have in XMPD. Ideally, they could start with the centrally authorized product, so they should be, um, they should make sure that the authorization number and the EU number is the same. Um, for each of their products, and also that are following the format that I have, that you can see here on the slide. You also have chart chapter 3.2 of XCVMPD where all this information is explained. This is an example that we have taken from our UAT environment. You can see that the authorization number is something like really long, covering different presentations, and this shouldn't be this way. Um, in this case, the ME holder should update this product to reflect the correct marketing authorization number at both levels, so the match and merge can be done correctly. Uh, moreover, something that they can also check is the full presentation name that they have for all the products in EV. In theory, all the EV codes that are part of the same medicinal product should have the same present, full presentation name. Here you can see an example where 
all the products have the same name, but there is one where we have an extra dot at the end of the of the product of, of the name. Everything or all the EV code should have the same uh, full presentation name. Uh, moreover, and this is something that we have also I have also checked for some of the products that we have in EV, and some QPPVs have already been contacted. If a centrally authorized product was transferred to another ME holder, the authorization status in XEVMPD must be not valid, superseded by marketing authorization transfer. Otherwise, this product will be migrated to PMS when in principle it shouldn't. So if you have transferred a product to a different ME holder, please check that the authorization status is this one. Otherwise, your product will be migrated to PMS and it will look like there are duplicates. It wouldn't be a problem because they will be assigned to different ME holders. So the valid transfer and the not valid transfer would be assigned to different ME holders. But anyway, if we want to have clean data in PMS, this is something that we need to, um, to check. Um, then if this is not the correct authorization status, this your EV code is not referring to this authorization status, you can send an invalidation task to XEVMPD to correct um, this status. All this information is also explained in chapter seven of the UIG. We, I know that we promised that we were going to release the next version of chapter seven and chapter nine during Q4. Nevertheless, due to the lack of time that we have, we need to review the comments that we have received from the SMEs, we need to review the documents, etc. We have not been able to do it, uh, but we plan to do it during Q1. Um, so you will have, they are still valid. We want to, uh, to include additional, uh, information, additional examples, etc. If we go to the next slide, is the recommendations that we have for the NAPs. It's something similar. If you go to chapter seven of the EUIG, you need to make sure that the data that we are using to group the products are correct in your um, XCVMPD data. So the full presentation name is the same for all the products that are um, going to be grouped in the same medicinal product, that you don't have duplicates in XVMPD, the authorization status is correct, that you have data in the mandatory fields that we have for the initial migration. So we are not going to migrate any product where one of those fields have missing data. So for example, if there is no authorized pharmaceutical dose form or a legal basis or a medicinal product type, this product or this EV code is not going to be migrated to PMS. Uh, moreover, we are not migrating the products or the EV codes where the authorization status is not valid transferred or not valid renewed. So it's also important for you to check that this is correct. Just a reminder that you can create exports from XCVMPD with the uh, export tool. If you just uh, Google export tool XCVMPD, you will have the link directly there to the user guidance, how to use it, how you can create the reports so you can analyze. Um, your data. Uh, said that, I would like to um, have the next slide, and I think we will have um, Andre explaining a bit how the security and access management for the API is working. Good morning, everyone. Still one minute left. Um, my name is Andre Ido. I'm the solution architect for the Spore platform. Uh, and I will share with you uh, an update on the PMS API and how we um, uh, technically uh, implemented access management uh, and self-service for it. Uh, and uh, we used this already in our uh, Alpha U18. So um, a short recap on the principles of uh, uh, the PMS API. Uh, and the way we grant access uh, to it. So uh, we aim to enable machine-to-machine -machine integration uh, using the OAuth 2 standard uh, and um, uh, the flow that we use uh, in the OAuth 2 standard for machine-to-machine -machine integration is client credentials. So we enable that on the PMS API uh, in a, up to our UAT environment, uh, and uh, that is the, the approach used for the UAT. Um, in terms of uh, managing roles and uh, access, uh, the EMA account management portal uh, uh, allows us to, to uh, let users self-service this. Um, 
uh, we need uh, first a registration of a super user for a specific organization, so either as here or industry. Uh, that is a usual role request that you can do on EMA account management. Uh, once <clears throat> we approve the super user role, uh, for um, a specific user in the context of their organization, they uh, are then able to self-service uh, their request for API access, which will then generate the necessary credentials uh, to integrate on their own side uh, yeah, uh, in their own systems using the OAuth2 um, standard that I mentioned. Um, uh, just a short uh, recap also on what is the current scope of uh, the PMS API that we envision to release first uh, next year. Um, we want to enable read access, so that is the ability to search for um, products in the PMS API uh, using the um, standard fire search criteria and syntax, uh, and the ability to get all information for a specific uh, medicinal product in the API. Can we, uh, do I have the ability? I don't, thank you for going to the next slide. Um, so um, in terms of the visualization of how the process works, uh, I didn't, uh, I, I put here screenshots on how to request the API access itself after a super user role has been granted. So there's now um, um, on the left side, a, a menu in uh, EMA account management where a new um, menu item will show up if uh, someone has the PMS super user role, and that is the request API access menu item. And with that, um, well, the first screen is uh, related to accepting the EMA uh, terms and conditions for API access, and then uh, uh, the next screenshot on the right side uh, will show up where you can uh, choose uh, what application you would like to have access to, uh, in the context of which organization, uh, provide a uh, contact email to which you will receive the uh, credentials um, on, and then selecting the type of uh, API role. Um, this type of view is now highlighting the PMS um, uh, request for an industry user, for example. Uh, however, yeah, depend this is uh, uh, on the account management portal. This will be extended um, to any application that uses uh, OAuth2 with client credentials uh, that is hosted by the EMA. So in the future, we also envision, for example, to have SMS uh, access being granted in the same manner. Um, can we go to the next slide? Uh, this is a screenshot of how the uh, information will be uh, sent by email. Uh, with the client credentials to be used uh, in the OAuth2 flow. Um, and that should be in, uh, the information needed to uh, authenticate against uh, uh, a Microsoft URL mentioned there. And with the uh, generated token, you can then access the PMS API in the context of your organization. Uh, this is the type of flow that we've um, um, tested also for granting access, but for accessing the PMS API in the UAT. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Veronica, for the conclusions of the UAT. Thank you. Thank you, Andre, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, as as already mentioned by Marcos and Andre, one of the objectives that we aim to uh, address in Q4 23, so the last part of the year, is indeed the launch of the um, PMS API UAT. So what have we have been doing so far, we have been launching a test to confirm that uh, users, specifically industry and NCAs, so the authorities, a super user, were able to connect to the PMS API, machine to machine system. Uh, we have been gathering feedback on the success, whether successful or failed results. Um, in terms of timelines, we started as a kickoff meeting on the 8th of November to onboard all the SMEs in PMS. Uh, we had a total of 10 testers. Those testers have been involved and they have started to um, check the connection, machine to machine to connection to PMS API between the 30th and the 24th of November. This was the first round set up for us because we wanted to make sure um, to gather all feedback right on time before Christmas time. 
uh, indeed, from the 27th of November until December, we have been uh, working to address the bugs that we've been that we they have been identified for us. Triaging, of course, uh, based on the priorities, and then a second round as soon as the uh, bugs that we have identified will be fixed and addressed, we will uh, launch the second round um, of this PI. Um, API UAT in PMS. So, as I was saying, uh, we have been engaging with 10 testers, uh, six were representative of industry, while four were from national competent authorities. Upon that uh, first round, the findings that we have been um, identified in cooperation with our testers were uh, basically mostly related to um, PMS. So, we had um, some testers uh, who basically failed, a total of four testers failed uh, to connect with the P uh, PMS API uh, because of the um, bug at the level of the UAT firewall, but also at the level of how uh, the system could be queried in terms of looking for products. Uh, these are already, um, the team is already working on that to address and hopefully will be uh, solved in Q1, uh, beginning of Q1. Other two bugs that we have been identified uh, were mostly related to the IAM um, system. So the way the uh, the role in PMS was um, requested, we noticed that there were some issues at the level on how the credential for the API connection were generated. I mean, uh, didn't didn't land correctly, so we already addressed in this point. And also, um, there was uh, one uh, tester who didn't manage to connect because of the um, the request was not correctly linked to the right org ID. So overall, we also noticed there was some lack of knowledge in how to use API. We will be addressing this last point in creating um, uh, in updating chapter six which is already in the radar, uh, but in total, six uh, tester out of 10, that we, they all successfully connected and were able to query PMS API. So looking for products and also um, searching also for several type of products overall. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Veronica, Andre, and Marcos. Well, we have quite a few questions that poured in for um, for PMS, as you can as you can imagine. Um, top of the list um, is in production PLM. So that's the PLM uh, portal. We have not yet seen NPs. I'm assuming that refers to NAPS. Uh, when will the uh, NAPS start appearing on PLM and will EMA follow a targeted approach to release NAPS in PMS? Thank you. Who, uh, who wants to take that one? I can take that one. So um, I don't know if this person was, ah, well, uh, yeah, it's Kepa. So already in, very, oh, sorry, Christina presented a bit the um, timelines that we will have for PMS, PLM, and also for EAF. So yeah, we can relate. We will be publishing this timeline shortly if they are not already published. So you can always refer to to that to that slide. Um, I think I will not spend more time here to reply to their questions. But yeah, the timelines will be published and are the ones that uh, Christina presented in the um, previous session. Before we uh, before we move on to the uh, to the product UI, that's a question from uh, Elizabeth Godet, and that uh, says that Chapter Seven, Version Two mentions that XEVMPD data quality issues can result in an incorrect migration of data into PMS. Will a list of data types resulting? Oh, where did that? I need to. Ah, uh... uh, yeah, I can. Re uh, it's like will a, a list of data type result in incorrect migration along with yeah, the data along with the data. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Uh, if this will be published. So it was not under our activities to publish this. The uh, I'm doing some checks on XEMPD. I'm focusing now on CAPS, but I have also done some um, things on NAPS. Mm, chapter seven already explains which are the data quality issues that might result in the in wrong migrations. So ME holders can already refer to that chapter. 
nevertheless, I think it's a good idea. Maybe we can involve the SMEs, and Elizabeth is one of them. So maybe uh, we can involve them to create a list of these activities that AME holders can perform with the data in XMP to make sure that the migration is done smoothly. Thank you. Um, to uh, respect the time box, uh, I am going to uh, invite, I think it's going to be you again, Marcos, to, uh, yes. to talk about uh, product, uh, the product user interface. Uh, UI refers to user interface. Um, and um, also here, uh, while we get to the, uh, the slide back on, um, so anyone that indeed still has questions about PMS, the team will do their best to answer as many of them as, as possible on Slido, and th that will be published um, on, the, on the site. So to get your questions into Slido, go to slido.com and uh, type in uh, the hash code 9116064 or scan the QR code on your phone. Make sure you select the right room and then indeed uh, you can ask your public question. If you want to ask a private question, uh, please use the poll feature also in Slido. So those are questions we will not publish. Um, so and don't forget indeed to uh, upvote questions that you really want to see um, answered live. Uh, back to you. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, for the product UI, um, as well as for PMS, it's been a really fruitful quarter. Um, what have we done during this quarter for the product UI? So we have done some UI and UX improvements. We have continued uh, developing the edit pages that I will show you later. We have already started the analysis and the design of one of the processes. So maybe you remember from other system demos and other webinars, we have different processes that will happen in the product user interface. One of them is the enrichment of data um, uh, of the products that we have. So this is the first that we have taken. We have started the analysis and the design. In Q1, we will also continue with um, this discussion. We will involve also the SMEs um, so they can provide their feedback on this uh, process. What we have also done during this quarter, we have implemented the security and access management of the product UI. You know that we have different users, so the qualified industry user, the normal industry user. We also have NCAs users or EMA data stewards. So we have implemented all these different uh, roles into the system. Um, what we have also done together with the PMS API that we have presented before, we have done an alpha UAT of the product UI together with the SMEs. Um, what we have found in this um, quarter is that we don't have any blocking bugs after the alpha UAT. So we have received a couple of comments like, yeah, maybe you should move this section here, or this field should be moved here, or, you know, comments like this is more on the usability of the system, like maybe the performance was not the best one that we are also improving, uh, but it, we didn't find, or the SMEs didn't, fa didn't find any uh, blocking um, bug that is preventing us from going live with the view pages. Um, what we have found also is not part of the UAT because this is on the edit pages. We have found a couple of bugs on the edit pages that we need to fix uh, during next quarter. I think this is the only slide that I have. So I will uh, proceed with the um, system demo. So let me share my screen, which is this one. Can you? Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so welcome again. I have already presented this part a um, couple of times in the previous system demos that we have had. But here you have again the product UI. Um, this is in the PLM portal together with the EAF. For the moment, it's not in production. We are only in the UAT environment. So you can see here that we have, this is the, let's say, well, the landing page is this one that is going to be uh, changed by the one that Christina have presented. So if I sign in with my EMA account, um, this is the landing page that is going to change. So let me go to the products of my organization. 
what we have done here is this let's say landing page of the products of my organization depending on your role you will have access to different products if you are an industry user you will have only access to those products that are under your um the organizations where you have requested the access to in IAM. If you are an MCA, you will have access to products on your country plus the centrally authorized products. I am a, a role, um, my role is the EMA data steward, so I have access to all of them. Uh, what we have decided is that this landing page will be an empty page. We will not load any product here. Uh, because the amount of products that we have is so big that we are requesting the users to start filtering with some criteria. So, uh, for example, if I want to start searching by, uh, I don't know, products in Spain, I don't know if in this system I have any, uh, I will be able to search. I only have six products. Um, I think for EU, I have way more products in this case. So I can search for products where the authorization country is EU. You can see here that at the beginning, I am, uh, let's say in this table, I have only 100 entries, but the system is telling me that I have 9,000 products. So if I want, I can click here to load additional records. This is something that will happen to, let's say, few companies where they have a lot of products. For most of the companies, they might not need to reload if they don't have more than 5,000 records. In case they have 7,000, they can still uh, load all of them in this page. But we will we are working to create reports, let's say, where you will be able to have access to all the data. This is just the way that we decided to uh, do it for the moment because this way we can say, uh, the performance of the system is way better than if we load all the products from the beginning into this table. Uh, so here you can see that I have, I'm showing one out of 10 of uh, 5,100 entries. I can reload another 5,000 if I want. For the moment, this is fine. Um, you can see that here I can say, okay, show me 50 rows um, here. I can also collapse this so I can have a better view of my products. I can also download. Uh, this is already something that I showed to you, but I will do it again here. So you will have a list um, in an Excel of all the products that we have in this um, table that we have loaded. So in this case, you can see that we have five, um, the 5,100 products that were loaded plus this extra row. That's why we have one more. Um, this Excel contains the data that we have in, in this table. Moreover, what I can do is continue, for example, if I want to have here only the tablets, um, I can filter by um, products where tablet is mentioned in this um, table. Um, and what I can do, for example, is select, um, I don't know, a couple of products here because I want to use them somehow. But then I need to know, oh, which are the products that I have selected? I have this button here which says view selected products. In this case, it will show me only the ones that I have selected or view available products. I come back again to the full list of products that are, um, let's say, covering these um, criteria. I can continue selecting different products, um, etc. So here I will have now a bigger table. Um, this is what we have for the uh, landing page. What I want to do uh, now, I will reset this part here. I want to show you a product, um, for example, for the ones that I have in Belgium. Um, you see that I have more than, I have 7,000 products, more than 7,000. So if I load them all, I'm going to um, show you so now what the system is doing is it's going to um, um, where we have all the products um, from PMS and it's loading all this information. So we don't do it from the beginning, again, to uh, have a better performance. Now I have 5,000 here. I will say, okay, show me the ones where I have um, tablet, for example. Um, and I will also add, I don't know, this active substance, substance for example, Sertraline. 
And here, um, as you can see in this description, the default uh, value is like, um, I want to see the tablets and the search file in it. But if I click here, and here I have eight entries, but I can click here and then I have more products. In this case is tablets or search file in it. So for example, I have here all the tablets, uh, but I also have the search file in as film, quality tablet, um, etc. So this filter can be used um, as you as you want this if you want to do it like and or if you wanted to use it like the option or um, i'm gonna show you this product um, for the moment we are loading when i click on the pms id i'm loading it in the same page but we are going to um, change it it will be open in a different tab this is a feedback that we have received from the sme so we think it makes sense here you have all the information that we have that we currently have in in pms so we have this um, top part here where we have the name of the medicinal product we have the pms id the authorization country any holder the authorization status we will also have the version number of this product and when was um, last updated for the moment we don't have this information but we will include it here uh, we have data of the medicinal product so all this data that you see here is coming also it's already reflected in chapter two so we have pms id the domain the name with the different parts um, we have the product classification where we have the abc code uh, we also have the legal basis if it's a gmo or not as a feedback, we will be also moving all this section on top because we receive the feedback that is useful for users to see the ATC code um, um, on the top part instead of coming down here and having to open this accordion. We have also implemented this expand all where we can open all the accordions at the same time so we can see all the data together and, and then I can collapse one by one or I can collapse them all at the same time. Um, we also have additional information. So, for example, everything related to the marketing authorization information. We have the therapeutic indications um, with the comorbidity. In this case, for the moment, this is still um, empty because we don't have this data in XCMPD, but it will be provided by the applicants at some point. We have the manufacturers. I guess it's empty because this is an app for, so we don't have manufacturers data for the moment. We have the ingredients um, here, the active role with the manufacturers that are linked to them. So this section that you, have, you can see here, the medicinal product is where we have, let's say, the list of all the manufacturers or the list of all the ingredients or the list of medical devices. And then they will be linked to the different sections. So to the packages, to the manufactured items, to the pharmaceutical product, et cetera, et cetera. We are following the same structure as chapter two of the UIG. What you can see here on ingredients as well is you can download the ingredients part. So you will have in an Excel, um, let me see if I can open this one. So you have the um, um, ingredients with the SMS code, the substance type, the role, etc. So you can have a list of all the active substances that you have in your medicinal product. Medical devices is empty, uh, etc. Then we have the package medicinal product. Uh, where you can have your packages with the pack size information. This information is missing for the moment, um, but this will be provided at some point. And then we also have the pharmaceutical product. In this case, we have this pharmaceutical product with the route of administration, which is oral use. We have the ingredients, uh, and at some point we will have the devices. And here we have, like for example, the strength of this substance is 100 milligrams in one tablet. I just wanted to show quickly, this is a different environment. Uh, I think I need to log on again, maybe not. I want to show you, uh, like for example, for this product, uh, this is another environment, a UIT environment where we have this implemented and hopefully we will implement it soon um, in other environments, is the export to XML. So this is something that is really useful for the users. We have implemented this disclaimer because by exporting the XML, so the fire message of this medicinal product, you might be downloading confidential data. So this is a disclaimer that we have here for the data protection. And whenever you export this XML and you open it, 
yeah i want to open it you will have here i'm not going down because this is a cap and i think it might contain different confidential data maybe even if it's uat so you have the fire message of your medicinal product here is a really big message but you will have all the information so um, we have enabled this in case users want to um, have this information now this is for the view pages you have already seen this but i wanted to make a bit of recap and also show you like the improvements that we have done on the tables um, etc but one of the most important things that we have implemented is the edit pages and we have uh, already finished with all the edit pages we need to solve a couple of bugs let me I will just directly open a product that um, I wanted to um, to edit. So in this case, um, something important, the edit pages are just developed. So we have all the different fields um, to be editable. Now we need to build the processes on top. So for example, an enrichment process will only be able to perform updates on a specific pages or on a specific fields so what we have done is just build the edit pages i select this product i click on edit and now the system is creating a copy of the the data um, to make sure that i can edit the different fields of the of the product um, and then it will consolidate everything in a final message for the moment as, as i said we only have the basic edit pages for all the um, for all the sections that we have in in the product UI in the peer in the also coming from the chapter 2.2. So now I have uh, finished copying this data. So you can see that I have the same aspect, but now I can do or I have uh, additional buttons where I can, for example, include a name. This is a product from Spain, so I don't need to add new names. But for example, if I have a product in Belgium or I have a um, centrally authorized product where I need to include all the names in the different languages, this has to be included using the add name. We can add the legal status of supply. We can add different um, things. We can add ITC codes. I wanted to go to a specific use cases. So for example, this is an app. And for an app, I don't have manufacturers. So what we have created is this page to add a manufacturer. Uh, in this case, I open the um, manufacturers um, section, I click on that, and here I have a view to OMS. So this is a table where all the organizations from OMS are um, captured. I can search by a different company, but I will add this uh, as a manufacturer. I want to select this one. I can include uh, maybe a telephone number. I will remove it because um, this is giving an issue. I need to check. Um, I will just include my email, for example. The dance number is this one, and I don't have a separate admin address. So I have the manufacturer details for this company, the address, or ID, and look ID and I can save it. Um, this way I will have this new manufacturer with this information here. I can add a new one. Um, I don't know. This one I can select. What I can do is save a new as well if I want to, you know, include different manufacturers without the coming back and add manufacturer again. I just can click here or um, I can just save it. So I have at least two manufacturers. So these are two manufacturers that are used in my medicinal product. We will define later if these are the uh, active substance manufacturers or if these are the batch releasers or which is the operation tab that they have. Um, we can also include ingredients, but in this case we have all the ingredients so that it's fine. We have um, created the medical device. I'm just going to show you how this looks like. And for the medical devices, I can select all the information that I have for the medical device section. So the type of medical device is a co-packed, for example. Um, I have the medical classification is a two-way. I'm just clicking random uh, things, but you can see that we can include different um, um, fields and different data. All this is linked to RMS, so we are using the RMS terms to create our um, 
our data. The medical device identifier is this one. I don't know, I don't have a trait name, but then I can also include information about the notified body. Again, I have a view lookup, let's say, to um, OMS. I will use this one. Uh, the notified body number is this one. This is interesting, the manufacturer. As I have already created my manufacturers in this section, and I said this is the section where I include all my manufacturers, all my ingredients, etc. Now I have a look up to those manufacturers that I have included. So, for example, is this one. The function is the manufacturer of the medical device. The confidentiality indicator is confidential, let's say. And I can include all this information that I have here. Um, if I save it, then it's saved. And I have here the information of my medical device. It's a copac, it's a cap, it is identifier, and I have all this information that I have included. For example, the manufacturer with the confidentiality indicator, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so you can see how the edit pages work. Then let's go to the package medicinal product. I'm not going through all the pages because otherwise we would not really have time to see all. In this case, I already have a package medicinal product. This is coming from XCMPD most likely because in XCMPD I have the packages. What's the problem is that I have missing data here. So I don't have a pack size because I don't have a pack size in um, XCMPD. The package description is also missing because in XCMPD this field is optional. And I don't have, at some point, this is, sorry, I didn't say that before. You will have the EV codes related to your package and also related to their medicinal products. So it will be easy for the users to know, okay, ah, this is my package and this is linked to this um, EV code in XEMPD, or this is my medicinal product and is linked to all these EV codes in XEMPD because sometimes we are grouping EV codes to create a medicinal product. Now, I want to um, um, include some information of my medicinal uh, product, of, sorry, of my package product. In this case, what I want to do is I want to uh, include, for example, a package description because I want to say, okay, this is uh, the package for the 28 tablets in blister alu, alu, for example. And um, I'm saying this in English. Well, I should do it in Spanish, but okay. Um, this is English, select. And I can also say the legal status of supply is not subject to medical prescription, for example. And what I can do, and this is important because some processes will rely on this data, is I can add a pack size. The pack size in this case is 28, as I have already said in the package description. And here I need to select tablets. So I use it, sorry, tablet. You can see that I can filter, I can apply. So I can select this, I can save it. And I will save this as well. So you can see that now for my, for this package, I have the MA number, I have the pack size, the legal status of supply, and I have the package description and the language. I can then also add um, here legal status of supply. I can add the supply term, promotion. All these fields uh, can be added as well. The data carrier identifier, I will add this as well, because this somehow can maybe be linked to um, EPI, because at some point this will be a use case. And the system that I'm using, I think here we had a bug. Um, because the table is not correct. You see, we are um, pointing this to a different RMS list, but we will solve this issue. Um, but in the meantime, I can save at least this, this value. Um, you can also see here that I can do any change and I don't have an, not really a lot of um, uh, validation activities here. I can save the, for example, the data carrier identifier without an identifier system. We will be implementing implementing these business rules to say, okay, you can only save this if the identifier system is also uh, reported. But for the moment, what we have built are the edit pages. So again, here you have the um, 
packaged medicinal product with the pack size that we didn't have before. Um, what I'm going to do now is, is going to the pharmaceutical product and if I have any, I'm not sure if for this product I had, a, yeah, I have this pharmaceutical product with the, this is the um, administrable dose form, the route of administration, and here I have my active substances with the strength. Um, what is the uh, point here is that I can edit this information um, if needed. Um, yeah, but sorry, because this is not what I wanted to show. I wanted to go to the uh, manufacturer items. And let me see. No, because we don't have this information. Um, yeah, I'm not able to show it now here, but the idea is that we will, when I have the manufacturer items, I can create them here, but I don't have time now. We will be able to also link the manufacturers uh, that I have here to the manufactured items. We will be able to link them to the pharmaceutical product, to the ingredients of the pharmaceutical product, um, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we can also link them to the devices if we have any to the um, medicine, to the pharmaceutical product. So this is all the relationships that we will be able to uh, include in the in the system once we have created here the manufacturers or once we have included the ingredients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So with this, I think we have a couple of minutes um, for the questions. See if there is any. I hope there are questions. Um, so back to you, Yuri. There certainly are, Marcos. Let's see. So at the top of the list, we have. Oh, um, sorry. Can you maybe share because I'm. Yeah, so um, I will. The, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there we go. So we had um, in the last session, you said that the process, uh, or you may say that the process discussions will only start in Q1 2024. If this is so, you have created a system without knowing what the process will be to use it. How do you know if it will be fit for purpose? So maybe a little bit about our, our process and how we, uh, how the two and the system and how the two will work together, what we anticipate. So um, that is not completely uh let's say real because um we already knew which are the processes that should happen in the product ui uh we also know which are the fields that will be used in the product ui um so what, what we have built is first the view pages we are building now on top the processes and now we will discuss okay i have an enrichment which are the fields that should be editable, for example, or I have a notification we see is for changes on QPPVs, for example. So processes are, and the discussions on processes are not really how do I edit a field. It's more related to how to submit the data, who is going to review the data, what's the data flow. So all this uh, is going to happen with the product UI as a support, but we will also have processes running in the API. So um, these discussions on processes is not only for the product UI, it's also for the API, and it's more on a data flow level, validation processes, who's submitting what. It's a bit more wider the discussion on the processes. And as you can see, and I hope it, I have tried to use case a process um, where I need to enrich data that is missing in my product. And you know, you can see that the system is already fitting it, and we have not built any process on top. It's just with the edit pages. So once we build the process on top, it will even fit better. Um, so yeah, the, and these discussions are going to happen. These processes are going to start in now in, in January with the SMEs. Thank you, Marcos. Then the uh, the next question on the list is um, in the initial release of the user interface, will the export functionality provide uh, it in the uh, so in an Excel format as well? It would be very valuable to have the export of a list of packaged medicinal products in addition to the medicinal product packaged or medicinal product data. Uh, yes, so I have shown a couple of Excel's that you can already export. Um, it is true that these excels are mainly, so the first one that I show is the full list of products. 
and then the rest of the excels are only like for a specific medicinal product and we understand that it's useful if you can export for example a report where you can see your medicinal products all your medicinal products and all your packages linked to this medicinal product and if you have the ev codes linked to those packages that would be amazing so yes we are working on that hopefully in the next system demo i will be able to show you uh, those things but for the moment these are on the under development and also the smes are helping here with their uh, suggestions on which are the reports that would be better for the user sure that's a very welcome answer yeah. um then uh, does the facility to add new data imply that one day type 1a variations could be replaced by data entry into the plm product ui I'm not the one to reply to this answer. I think there is a new legislation on variations that is coming soon. So maybe you can ask them to include these new processes on the product. I cannot reply to that. So we are not changing any um, processes on variations. Variations have to be submitted the way they are um, doing this. Uh, you are doing this at the moment. So we also have an amazing product, which is the web-based DAF that you can use for these type 1a variations so for the moment we are not changing anything there there might be discussions in the future to use pms to you know provide some of those changes that um yeah they do and uh, do and tell but for the moment we are not changing anything there exactly so lots of things are possible but nothing is implied That's, yeah uh, exactly okay then, uh, when will the edit option be available to update and enrich PMS data? Well, we um, we need to do a lot of things to be sure that we can um, release this part of the product UI. Um, moreover, um, we might release this in different steps. So we are discussing now the enrichment. So maybe we can we will be able to release the enrichment part of the processes first and then the update in a different um, moment. We need to discuss and we are having some conversations how we can support other projects with this enrichment of data. Uh, but for the moment, we don't have timelines. Um, Hopefully next year we can come with some additional information on the um, rollout of, of this functionality. First of all, we will release the view pages and then we discuss when we release the edit pages. Thank you, uh, Marcos. Then we uh, we are almost at the uh, at the end of the, uh, the cycle here. So we've noticed that ingredients in PLM presumably coming from Simon, are not aligned to our ingredients in XEVMPD or Mod 3. What ingredients are supposed to be in PLM? It's not clear to us. Yeah, so that is an issue that we have already identified. Um, as you know, the data that we have right now in the PLM portal is only coming from um, Siamet. So in Siamet, they have... Um, let's say they have a table with all the ingredients and in this table sometimes they are capturing the salt and not the active moiety of the active substance for your products. Uh, we are in discussions with them how can we solve this issue. We are also um, trying to analyze ourselves if we can uh, survive this. Nevertheless, um, I would say this should not be a blocker for uh, the functionality of the PLM portal because your product is still there and you are not let's say reusing the data or you don't have a structured data in the AF for the moment like to make these changes so this is under the radar we are discussing and we will try to come up with a solution as soon as possible thank you very much and the final question before we head into a short break how will the supportive documentation be provided to authorities, e.g. attached document? Will it be uploaded to PLM or are, will there be other, will there be another repository of documents like EPI? So that, for example, is one of the things that we need to discuss with the SMEs on the processes. How supportive documentation is going to be submitted, if it's going to be submitted, or when this is going uh, to be a story. Is this going to be a story in PMS? It's going to be a story in a different repository. Um, there will will there be a link to EPI where this will be located, etc. 
So we don't have an answer for the moment because this is part of the things we need to discuss in the uh, processes discussion with the SMEs. So sorry, but we don't have an answer. The investigation is clearly on yes. our radar. Though, so exactly. that's, uh, great. I'm uh, sure people will be reassured to, to hear that. That's uh, that's it for product UI, and it is 12:45. Uh, we'll have a, a short break, and then at 12:55, we will start talking about e uh, about EPI, um, and I will be handing over uh, back over to, to uh, Jean Michel to to facilitate that. Thank you very much, uh, Joris, and uh, talk to you back at 12:55 uh, sharp. <laughs> See you, all of them, all of you. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we are at 12.55 and now we are going to continue in the product life cycle management value stream. We are still in the same value stream and uh, we will um, uh, see a demo from Evin and Elizabeth uh, on uh, the EPI. And I think it's Evin who will uh, go first. Before, I would like to remind you, uh, for people who just join us, uh, you can give your feedback uh, using Slido. Uh, you can do it uh, by choosing the right room for the right product. So here we will be on PLM EPI room. And you can choose to be uh, public on, by uh, using uh, the Q&A of Slido or by using the poll, then you will remain uh, anonymous and uh, he, your question will uh, be hidden from the public. And on that, I will give uh, the floor to Evin. Thank you very much, Jean-Michel. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Evan Drusis, and I work at the Spanish agency IAMS, and I am the NCA Network Product Owner for API. So I, along with Elizabeth Scanlon, will be demoing EPI for you today. So here on this slide, we have summarized our PI objectives and PI achievements for quarter four of 2023. If we start on the left-hand side, we can see uh, the objectives that we defined at the beginning of the PI, which was to support pilot participants to achieve the first EPIs published from real regulatory procedures. And secondly, we look to implement a first limited versioning use case on publication of an update. So this would be update an existing API that has been affected by a variation. Um, and then some other activities, we perform some exploratory and design work to help us prepare for future uh, development. And lastly, we have performed some um, PLM wide optimization activities. Uh, so now if we scoot over to the right hand side, we can see our PI achievements. We have satisfied all of our objectives that we defined at the beginning. The first of which is the uh, ongoing EPI pilots. So during this pilot, we have uh, this pilot is currently ongoing at EMA and also at the NCAs of Spain, the Netherlands, Denmark and Sweden. So this pilot is ongoing and we'll, we'll, we will be looking to finish this uh, pilot in July of 2024. But we already have some important uh, outcomes from this pilot and some huge milestones, which is that we have published the first EPIs. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the companies that are participating in the pilot. Um, all of your experience and feedback has proved very valuable to us. Uh, so much so that we have some reported bugs that have been reported by pilot participants, and we have resolved several of these bugs. And um, all, all pending bugs can be found on the PLM portal. We have a knowledge art article for EPI known issues. So all of the uh, other known bugs uh, are spelled out there. Next, we have uh, for another achievement for this PI is that we have developed a basic versioning of EPIs. This has involved the creation of the archive status. So in EPI, we have a new status called archived. So once you publish a, an EPI based on an existing EPI, the old one is archived. And then we, of course, publish the new version. And then last we have here are some fire enhancements. This is uh, we have been enhancing. Uh, we have been enhancing the fire to ensure that what we are generating in the portal is uh, fire compliant. So to kick off the demo, I will be demoing the published APIs that can be found in the PLM portal. Let me share my web browser.
I hope everyone can see my web browser. Yes, we can. So Evan. I am at, thank you so much for the confirmation. So here you can see I am at the homepage of the PLM portal. And to navigate to the published EPIs, you can click on the public register and list tile and then click on published EPIs. So here we can see all of the EPIs that have been published so far. There are nine total EPIs, and we have at least one EPI from each participating NCA. Uh, so if we look at the CAP document, at the centralized procedures, we can see two here. And then if you go to the action column and click on view, we can take a quick look at the EPI. Um, so a quick summary on the left hand side here, you can see all of the product information documents. They are broken down by SMDC, Annex 2, labeling and package leaflet. This particular EPI has four package leaflets uh, and we can see the QRD template. We can see the structure of the document and we can nav easily navigate to a desired section. So we can click on five here, how to store the medicine and we are quickly brought to uh, this particular section. And the same can be said for all of these documents. If we go back up here to the SMPC, we can click on the name of the missile product and we are brought to that particular section. So again, you have here the tribute navigation and then the product information content on the right hand side. So this is one CAP document. We can quickly look at a Spanish NAP. This is a, uh, a NAP product, a national authorized product that has been authorized by the AMS, the Spanish agency. We can click on view. And we can see the same structure. Of course, everything is in Spanish here. Here we have the SNPC labeling and package leaflet. Again, the document is broken down by the QRD template with the content on the right hand side. And to uh, sum and to finalize here, I would like to point out is the uh, what I'd like to point out is the export button. So we have an export button that gives you several options for export. Uh, the first of which is an export to Word. This is our, this is a one single document, all the EPI documents in one single file with the title page, with the title page. This uh, resembles the EPAR document that is published for CAP medicines. Nextly, we have uh, another option for Word. This creates a zip folder with all the EPI documents stored individually. And lastly, we have an export of the Fire XML. Okay, so that is a little demonstration of the EPI display web page. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we have nine total EPIs, and as the uh, as the pilot progresses, you will see more and more EPIs being published on this web page. So I will now pass over to Elizabeth to give us a demonstration of the versioning functionality that we have enabled in this PI. Thank you, Evan. Let me share my. Uh my browser. Hopefully you can see that now. Yes, yes we, we can. can. Excellent. So I'm just going to do a little bit deeper dive into what Evan already described. We started to look at the story of versioning. At the moment in the MVP, if you make an EPI, a variation on a previous EPI, once you publish the variation, uh, the previous EPI has to be manually unpublished and it unpublishes and goes to a deactivated status and then it's gone. So we see the need uh, for versioning for EPIs, and this can be helpful for users who want to have the history of the product information. Uh, it can be helpful uh, to compare what has happened between different versions. And of course, uh, there can certainly be cases where it may be necessary for a healthcare professional or patient to link to a previous version of the product information when that is still in use. So let's have a quick look at that now. Uh, here is the EPI list page. This page is particularly familiar to people participating in our UATs or who've uh, watched our uh, demos before. And in uh, underneath the publish tab, I have an API uh, that's already published in this uh, test environment. And it has an API ID 1029, and it's for a medicine called DemoMed. And this is a published API. So. The, a variation comes along for this EPI and I need to create a new EPI. Uh, so I go through my usual process uh, for creating a new EPI. However, this new EPI is based on an existing EPI. So this is functionality we've had for a while. And we can choose 
Demomed V1, which was the one I showed you previously that was published. And our new variation is going to be based on this. So I'm going to select this. I'm going to go through all the usual process of saying what company I work for. And for the purposes of the demo, I'm going to just call this V2 for the procedure number. And uh, what I will do now is very quickly uh, step through uh, the steps of creating an API, not uh, actually doing any of the work of creating an API today. So I'm ready with my variation and I want to submit my update. So now you can see, and those familiar with the API list can see all the different uh, statuses that are up here. I now have an API, which is 1034 is the ID, and it's in submission status. Now, here I have been acting as if I was a company. I have uh, different uh, roles in here, so now I can switch over and act as though I'm a regulator. So the regulator comes and this variation is concluded, and the regulator can approve uh, this uh, this variation for publication. So I, I will approve it. And we also have a second step here of publication done by the regulator. So I'm going to publish. Now what has changed here is that now I am offered that I can publish the new updated version 1034. And I can put the previous version, the version one that we saw 1029 into archived status. So I'm going to publish 1034 and archive 1029 and I'll just say yes. And uh, what will happen now is that the version two will move into published status. Let's give it a minute. Now you can see the published tab is selected and the version two is in published status. We have a new tab uh, that is deactivated. Uh, and this in this tab, in the deactivated tab, the version one will appear. Uh, so we can also do an action where we can, uh, we have the confirmation here that we have changed this status to publish and moved the other version uh, to archived, excuse me, not deactivated, to archived. So you can see here, the version one demo med is now in the archived status and the version two is in the published status without me having to do manual unpublished activities and so on. And within the archived status, the company will be able to see all the past uh, versions uh, and they will be saved there for future use. One last thing to say about this, say for example, this version two needs to be unpublished. So if this version two needs to be unpublished here as the regulator, I can unpublish. And again, I have an option. I can simply unpublish it and not replace it, but I can unpublish it in case this is needed and replace it with the previous version 1029. So are you sure you want to unpublish and replace the previous version? I say yes. And now I have deactivated version two for some reason that was published early and now it needs to be activated, deactivated. And the version one is here and it's now back to being in published status. Now, once I have something in deactivated, I can then, as per the usual functionality, move it back to draft, work on it again, resubmit it again. So this was just a very quick run through the, the straightforward versioning story uh, that we have made in the last PI. We definitely need uh, to add more functionality on versioning, and we look forward to updating you on that uh, in future system demos. So this concludes the EPI demo for today. So thank you very much, Libby. We will go to the questions um, about EPI. So the first question is, uh, if there is a definite uh, timeline showing what the transition period to EPI will be and when EPI will become mandatory for all. Um, this Cap, is definitely a popular question. Yeah. So yes. we are, you know, we are we are performing the pilot in order to figure out how close we are to having something that can go full into business. What are the features that are still needed to be developed? And we're really in mid-flight with the pilot. Beginning in Q1 next year, we're going to start collating all the outcomes, and this is going to help us to know what are the epics we need to fulfill, and then we'll be able to give more uh, 
more, it won't be def definite timeline, but we'll be able to start giving shape to the timeline. So for now, we, we don't have this uh, available yet. There is a question about the cooperation or discussion with software vendors. Rims of, um, I just moved, it has been voted. So the question just moved. Um, Regarding, maybe I'll no? take the ah, second yeah. one. There. So is there any cooperation or discussion with software vendor like RIM software to provide an interface or module for API creation and, and maintenance? And I think this is also um, uh, linked to another question, which is um, ab about the process of creating API involve a lot of manual labor. How can this be improved in the future for processing large portfolio products? So I think those two questions can be maybe answered yes, at the same time. We are, we, so far, you know, we have been doing, uh, we have uh, been in contact with vendors, and, but we have been doing our close uh, collaboration, very close with the pilot participants. But we definitely uh, want to engage more with vendors on this, and we will uh, be considering this uh, moving forward. Again, of course, you know, we created an MVP. While there is a manual process there, it is not too onerous in comparison to other, you know, ways of creating API, you know, even globally. And uh, indeed, involvement of vendors who can also uh, maybe do this on behalf of companies in the future is desirable. So we can see this in the roadmap uh, and we're fully aware of this. Uh, and this is going to be part of our planning going forward. <laughs> And there is also uh, the last question we'll take because then we need to move on. It would be very desirable to have a uniform EU-wide standard rather than each member state having its own regulation regarding EPI mm -hmm. in general. And it I is. think here you can answer that one. Yeah. It is very desirable. We do have an EU common standard. It has been adopted by the Medicines Regulatory Network and the agreement of all the member states to adopt the same standard for EPI. So all I can say with that question is I absolutely agree. You know, we're involving the uh, early adopter NCAs in the pilot. We're fo following more or less the same business processes and so on. We're actively working together. Uh, and this is exactly the goal of the project. Thank you very much, Libby and Ewin, and we will uh, move uh, and the rest of the question will be answered offline and will be published on the corporate website. And now we will move to the next product, which is the regulatory procedure management with Madalina and Sara. And uh, as usual, if you want to give feedback, uh, you can use Slido, uh, the poll for the hidden uh, questions and the Q&A for public question and answer. And don't forget to choose the right room uh, corresponding to, to the product. So here it will be PLM RPM room uh, to post your question or your poll. So now I would like to give the floor to Madalina. Hello, uh, good afternoon. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, we can. I'm, thank you. I'm Madalina Tutamare, and uh, together with my colleague Sara, today we are going to bring you up to date with uh, the status of our uh, product and uh, of course we are here to represent uh, the teams we are working with and who will which will uh, receive and uh, merit all the thanks for the work uh, done in the past uh, quarter and of course in the past uh, uh, 20 months um, because we are uh, around the corner with our first online I would like just to provide you with a short uh, update on our plans. For this reason, uh, I will present online uh, of our uh, well of our product. Um, and in this slide, you would see this concept of, concept of epic, which you probably heard also before today and previous time. But to explain, uh, we use the concept of epic to box the number of procedures that will deliver functionalities for the end users. And I'm talking procedures because we are uh, developing regulatory procedures uh, uh, in IRIS. So in this context, our stakeholders are uh, the industry and the network. Uh, hence, in EPIC 1, we are developing uh, since 2022, variations Article 61.3 and marketing authorization transfers for veterinary and human products 
we tested, of course, um, um, uh, during the development, and we had uh, two rounds of uh, user acceptance testing, uh, which one was uh, finalized recently and it gave us means that we are uh, fit for go live um, in the future date. And that's really something we wanted to share with you. Our go live date is January 2024. Uh, just to maybe also clarify, the scope of this go live will be a limited number of products, mainly generic, simple products, full life transfers to the iris and we will of course communicate that in due time. Now what is uh, important that uh it is to management the most products uh we can sometimes of market international Madalina, Madalina, so, sorry, yes. we can't hear you. We can't hear you very well. Maybe you can turn your video off, please. The connection is not I very good. My video off. I did hear some background noise, but I tried to ignore it. Uh, can you hear me now better? Yeah, that's better actually. Yes. So I, I do you. think there was some background noise. Uh, I don't know where I lost you or where you lost me. But I can repeat. Yeah, just uh, the last uh, two minutes. Thank you. Okay, so maybe I start from the beginning, where I was explaining the concept of epic. Maybe that was around, or even a little bit later. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so uh, going back and repeating, uh, practice makes perfect, right? So, uh, what we are um, used to call epic, at least also for regulatory procedures, is to box the number of procedures that will uh, deliver functionalities for the end users and uh, for us end users are the uh, uh, EMA, the industry users and the network. Uh, and uh, what is uh, also um, important and why we, uh, we want to present you with the roadmap is because we are uh, preparing to go live on 23rd of January um, 2024 with a, a small uh, sample of products, which are mainly generics. And the reason is because uh, uh, these products have a simple life cycle and we could test the life, life cycle only using variations, Article 61 procedures and marketing authorization transfers. With that being said, um, uh, this is the first swim lane, what you can see in Epic One. I also want to clarify the scope our development, which is EMA-led procedures, and that means um, um, mostly centrally approved products will be affected or will be covered by our scope, and uh, MRPDCP and nationally approved products will be will be well um, uh, affected only if we if they are included in a procedure. Uh, which is led by the EMA, like uh, PSUR or PSUSA, basically, or a referral or a pass uh, procedure in the future. Uh, so the, the most important is the first swim, swim lane, of course, with the go live again on 23rd of January 2024. And um, on the second swim, uh, swim lane, we also have uh, uh, another big piece of work, which is uh, called Epic 2 and includes most of the remaining procedures of the life cycle in order to have, and this is what we aim for, um, of, well, to be able to move all our product man uh, life cycle management as much as possible in Iris starting with 2025. All right, so uh, this was the overview, just to give you a bit of an idea of what is uh, coming up next year. So a lot of development, basically we are going to develop the whole life cycle uh, procedures, all the life cycle procedures, and this will lead to us moving to IRIS and uh, making use of the portals for industry and uh, of, uh, a network together.
And with this, uh, I would just like to go to the next slide and uh, it's mostly to introduce Sarah. Um, uh, as you can see on the, sc on the screen, we had some objectives and um, a lot of them were uh, achieved. So we are uh, on the last uh, uh, meters to prepare again, um, ahead of the go live. And that makes us uh, really happy and uh, really fulfilled professionally. And uh, we will see part of this, these achievements um, demoed by Sara, um, and she will uh, uh, demo to you the emails uh, on Iris for industry and network users and um, notifications. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, Sara. Before. Thank you so much, Magalina. Just give me a few seconds. For, for me to share my screen. I'm also going to stop the video for the network connection. All right, could you confirm that you can see my screen? We can see your screen, uh, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, in this uh, system demo, we would like to showcase what we developed uh, in terms of email notifications for our variations, our marketing authorization transfers, and Article 6013 procedures in IRIS. Uh, the rationale behind uh, what we developed is really to follow um, what we have in our current process. So to communicate uh, to the different stakeholders, um, to marketing traditional holders, uh, to rapporteurs, to network, to European Commission um, at the major milestones of a procedure. And so I have here a um, variation requiring assessment case. And uh, the first milestone that we have in uh, these procedures, also the same for variations type 1B and uh, type 2, it's the uh, validation. So once we move uh, the procedure from under uh, validation to under evaluation at the validation date, we uh, have set up uh, some automated notifications. Uh, one to the rapporteur and network and another one to the marketing authorization holder. So I will open uh, the first email notification, which is to the rapporteur. And this is an email template that it's automatically, automatically generated. And that has some information on uh, the case. It also has the link to the IRIS network portal where the rapporteur and assessors can um, consult uh, the details on the procedure, especially the timetable. We also have a link to the evaluation subfolder. This is where uh, uh, the rapporteur and assessors will have um, all the documents they will need um, uh, for the assessment, uh, besides the ones that we receive through 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 the gateway, uh, so assessment reports, um, the PI, ASMF assessment report, it will be here for them to 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 work. Uh, and then uh, we have some uh, information uh, on 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 the deadlines that they can consult in the IRS portal. Also at validation, we have the email notification to the marketing authorization holder. So this is addressed to the portal contact that's assigned to the case. And again, uh, same type of uh, communication. We have some information on the uh, procedure itself, on the products that are involved, and the validation date. We have a link to the portal where they can uh, go and consult uh, their ongoing submissions and, and, and see then the uh, submission details. Uh, again, also something that's important there, it's the timetable for them to see uh, the deadlines on the procedure. And then we have some uh, further information 
that is specific per process type. So in this case, we have variation requiring assessment. We have this type of information regarding submissions, but um, for a type 1B, uh, we would have other type of information. So it's really dependent on, on the process type. And, and again, we try to recreate what we are currently doing. So um, again, we will be familiar with the information that's being uh, provided. So this is at validation stage. Then uh, again, we have, um, let's say, if the procedure goes for a request for supplementary information uh, in the outcome uh, date, we would share the documents with the company. So uh, what we have developed is another notification that the company, the marketing acquisition holder, will receive uh, every time we share documents. So now let's say I'm going into my evaluation folder and I uh, I am at the outcome stage uh, at, the, at the request for supplementary information and I want to uh, share the uh, assessment report with the marketing acquisition holder. So let me just copy document to submission and it might take a few seconds. Let's just check once it's here. Okay, it's here already. And it might take a few minutes. Here we have. So what we developed is that every time we uh, are uploading or sharing, uh, with the marketing acquisition, marketing acquisition holder new documents. Um, again, the portal contact assigned to the pro to the procedure will receive an email notification to let them know that new information or or new documents have been uh, uh, updated to the to the portal. Um, and again, telling them. Uh, so uh, in the documents from EMA, this is where they, they will be able to check um, the new documents sent by, by, by us. Uh, then um, we also have a tool we've developed uh, that we've developed uh, called the advanced email templates. This will allow us to have to generate um, email templates which we can edit before sending. And just to save time, I've already uh, generated an example of uh, those types of emails. In this case, I'm, I generated an email that we send to the rapporteurs and to network. Once we have received the responses from the market acquisition holder, and uh, once we are uh, restarting the clock for the procedure. So these types of emails, we can edit them before before sending, and once we are happy with the uh, with the message, we can just click send uh, uh, to 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 send a notification. Then another uh, um, major milestone uh, for which we we developed the notifications is the um, the final opinion or. Uh, outcome stage when when we we send a the final notification or the opinion for the procedure and in that case I'm moving now to a, another case that is as already at this stage so we moved out from opinion into uh, the decision stage this is we have an immediate commission decision that's why we're moving to pending AC decision and once we move the procedure out of the opinion stage, then another uh, email notification, automated email notification, is sent uh, to um, the network, to the rapporteurs, co-rapporteurs, PROC rapporteur, if they are involved in, in the procedure. And if there is an immediate commission decision, we also involve the, 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 the European Commission. Again, this email is uh, uh, has more or less the same structure that we saw for the um, email sent at validation stage. We have some information on, on the procedure. Um, again, we have the products involved, the link to the network portal, and in this case, 
we have a link to the outcomes of folder. So this is where then at the end of the procedure, we would have um, all our outcome documents that are relevant uh, to share with, um, with my network, with the European Commission. Then for the industry, for the market authorization holder at outcome stage, uh, we would again share the documents and again you would have um, the same type of email so uh, for for when every time we 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 communicate with the marketing authorization holder this is the the same email that you that the the, the companies will receive then another uh, feature we developed is um, an automated notification um, once the marketing district holder uh, uploads documents. So I'm now going into the portal and to find this uh, procedure. Here it is. And let's say me as marketing authorization holder, I would like to upload a document, let's say product information, and I send it. So once we have uh, an input from industry, we also, uh, as case resources internally, we also receive uh, an automated email uh, just to alert us that uh, we have some new information for, for, for our procedure. So we have some new documents in the input from industry folder um, in, in, in the portal. We also have a link that takes us, we go to the input from industry and here we have the, the document that uh, uh, we just shared. Another feature that we developed is uh, in terms of uh, email notifications, um, it's the case for uh, withdrawal. So let's say I want to withdraw as a marketing acquisition holder, I want to withdraw this uh, market acquisition transfer. Again, I'm going into my ongoing submissions and here I have my transfer. I will first uh, write down withdrawal reason and submit, and then I can withdraw my submission. So once I withdraw, I have a, a, a case that is uh, changed to withdraw requested. And then here in, in my case, I have uh, the change of status as well, and I have an email notification that I receive uh, from the system. Again, automated to let uh, to let the portal contact for the procedure to let them know that um, we uh, received a withdrawal request, and then um, once we process the withdrawal. So I'm just writing here a withdrawal comment. And I'm withdrawing the case. And this might take a few seconds to change the status of the case. There we go. So now that the case is withdrawn, and once it's withdrawn, we have another automated email notification to the portal contact to let them know that the case has been uh, completed and closed. Again, with some details on the procedure and also with the, the note that they can consult any documents um, in the, the portal, in the documents from EMA uh, area. So this is what I wanted to showcase. Um, thank you so much. I guess I'll... Stop sharing my screen now. So thank you very much, uh, Sarah. We have uh, one question if you if you can answer to it. Huh? What's the connection of this system with the CDT?
Uh, I can take this one. Uh, the submission process remains as is, so it's unchanged. Uh, and the case is created by the EMA as of today uh, in, uh, in our uh, new uh, case management system. So for the moment, there is no change in the submission process and the case will be visible to the network and industry once we have created it uh, from the back end the demo. The future will probably look way different, but uh, uh, we are in an MVP mode uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madalina and Sarah. And I think uh, we can move on to the next product. And here I'm welcoming um, uh, Behan, and he will demo us what happened in the Union Product Database, the UPD, as we know it. And I will remind quickly for people who just join us, you can give your feedback from uh, Slido, you, using the QR code or uh, the number by connecting at slido.com. Uh, then you choose the, by, you need to choose the room, and it's PLM UPD in that case, and then you can choose either Q&A or polls. So the Q&A, your question and answer will be public, and the polls will allow you to have hidden question or hidden feedback. And on that, I will give the floor to Behan. Good afternoon, um, colleagues. Um, my name is Behan Mustafov, and I'm um, a product owner for the Union Product Database for Veterinary Medicines on the EMA site. Um, on this slide, um, on the left-hand side, you could see the, just as a reminder, the achievements from the quarter uh, three um, highlighted in red are those um, functionalities which um, continued to be uh, worked on in um, in this quarter quarter four um, in the middle as you can see we had a pretty busy um, agenda and on the right hand side are the achievements on the on the upd site and um, we have um, managed to finalize the spillover uh, work we have also um, developed the procedure number, the QPPV PSMF information becoming part of uh, national data, filter supply to substances and dates of creation and dates of deletion of the package included in the volume of cells. We did um, analysis of uh, the VNRA supergrouping, um, revised chapter two and seven, and uh, we have also concluded on two analyses uh, required for iris um, in red you see those uh, functionalities which were either included in the stretch scope uh, like the first one the 197 uh, which is to allow national treatment of certain vnra codes uh, and also um, we will continue in the beginning of january to work on the user story one and make vet packages for CAFs available other than valid, of course, available for IRIS. Um, at the bottom, I would like to highlight two significant pieces of work which will continue in the next quarter and maybe uh, the last one will also carry over into sprint two. Um, the re-architecting for improved reliability, availability and performance, also known as the decoupling MDM from fire, is really a milestone which need to be concluded before the PMS go live. Um, a number of teams are working together in order to achieve that. Uh, and the migration of the non-product environments to a single tenant must end by uh, end, of, end of May. And um, I would like to move to the next slide. Okay, and in the um, next demo, we will demo two functionalities. First one is for the NCI uh, UI users on the bulk upload of um, multiple product documents like product information or assessment report. It depends what it has been selected or for uh, the second one will be for NCAs and market authorization holder users and the ability to search by procedure number and then the 
after the um, system demo, I will do a, a three slides very briefly about um, F173, which is the QPPV and PSMF information becoming part of national uh, data. Okay, and now I hope that you can see my screen. This is the first yes, part can. of the demo. Uh, from the main UPD menu, click on upload documents. Please special, pay special attention to the system validations listed in the yellow banner, and there are quite a few. These validations are designed to perform automated checks and prevent errors in submitted documents, which could potentially lead to resubmission and other errors. The initial stage of validation checks are related to the naming convention, the format and the of upload document and the file size. You have two options, either by browse or drop the, the files in the designated areas you can see on the screen. In case of non-compliance to the document format, a size, a name, length, the submit button will be disabled and such documents will be highlighted in red. You can consult the arrow by hovering your mouse on the, each document. In the first case, you will see that the file is larger than 10 megabytes. And in the second case, it is less, it is not a PDF um, file. Um, then, once you um, see which are the documents, you could start um, removing the, the documents which have been um, highlighted and uh, just pay attention that uh, the different naming convention is really uh, applies uh, based on the, on the chapter two. The documents that will remain, um, for example, what is highlighted here on the screen is a public assessment report in English for CAP, where the animal species is the uh, only variable part. And in the second case, it is a uh, package leaflet, national package leaflet in German of a product authorized under mutual recognition, where the product name and the animal species are the variable uh, part. After you add the, the documents, then um, you can click submit and um, accept uh, documents that are not compliant with the second stage of validations will be highlighted in red. To view the specific errors, um, hover uh, mouse over each document and you could see exactly what are the errors of the individual uh, files. Please note that even if the error only applies to one document, none of the documents selected in the dedicated area will be uploaded. You can um, start removing the documents individually um, that didn't pass the second stage of the validation. And be aware that you can also add at any stage a new documents uh, on the submission. Um, after removing all, um, you can um, keep the, the, the documents that um, you wish to proceed on, click on um, submit, and then the system will display a pop-up message. Um, you can click accept or cancel, of course, and if the document upload fails due to technical issue, a notification indicates the product associated with the failed upload. In this um, second uh, part, we will demo um, the search. Uh, on the main menu, uh, main navigation bar, click on search. Please note that if you are a competent authority, like the logged in user, the system will display the list of all products available in the database based on the filter supplied. And if you are a market authorization holder users, which will um, show next, the system will retrieve the list of products associated with the organizations to which you belong as per the filter supplied. You can click um, uh, and select starts with or contains. Um, and in this case, if you type Emma, um, the system will retrieve all products which for which the procedure number starts with such uh, prefix. 
as you can um, see. And if you decide to enter um, double zero double two three three, select um, starts a weight or contains, and then the, you will see all the procedure numbers containing uh, that uh, numbers. Please note that if you are a competent authority, the search future is um, available in the following UPD uh, interfaces. Um, in search, create, um, you can go to create, you can go to mutual recognition, subsequent uh, release, uh, repeat procedure, etc. Then you could go to transfer of ownership, volume of sales, view volume of sales. Then you could also go to VNRA uh, view uh, submissions. Now, uh, if you are a marketing authorization holder, if you, as you can see on the screen, the procedure uh, number is available in um, OPAT. And you could find this in the marketing authorization status, the availability uh, status, download product data, the volume of sales, view volume of sales as well. And in the VNRA, submit VNRA and um, view uh, VNRA. And this um, concludes the, the demo. And now I would like to go back to the main um, presentation. And next slide, please. Okay, this uh, feature 173 is about the NCI UI and API users. QPPV and PSMF information um, are now part of the national data for the DCMR and SR uh, procedures. Feature 173 has been implemented because in the previous version of chapter two, the pharmacovigilance data was considered part of the common data for products authorized under uh, mutual recognition DC and SR. And this approach didn't allow having different values for these attributes in case of unrelated marketing authorization holders. To allow pharmacovigilance information at the national level for those products, 173 was implemented on the 8th of December, and this new feature will um, have no impact on the create operations. I really want to um, emphasize that, but will have impact on the update operations, and we will proceed now with the explaining on the next slide. Um, this is about the uh, for the create product part. The RMS continues to provide the pharmacovigilance information during the creation process, so all the products that belong to the same uh, procedure will contain the same pharmacovigilance information. If we go on the next slide. And um, this is regarding uh, product updates, um, i.e. provision of pharmacovigilance data after the creation or correction of the data. For the update, as you can see on the left um, hand side, at present, each responsible authority is in charge to update the pharmacovigilance information as part of a national update. And um, regarding C1, C5, and C6 uh, VNRAs, which is on the right hand side, the RMS continues to be in charge to approve, reject the VNRAs that impacts pharmacovigilance data. The main difference in regard to the previous approach is that earlier, all the products that belong to the same uh, procedure were updated with the same uh, value and now only the products that were selected and considered during the submission will be updated. And I would like to move now to my, um, my final slide. Um, this is a quick recap where you can uh, find uh, useful information, including uh, question and answer documents. Um, I would like to remind you that chapter two and chapter seven were updated in uh, early December. Please continue to consult with um, the revised uh, chapters.
um, release notes, as usual, they are, um, contain a lot of information of resolved and um, uh, new bugs. The, um, you have the links to, to the webinars and um, there are a number of bite-sized video tutorials which are also um, available. And with this, I would like to conclude my uh, presentation. I'm happy to look at the questions. Thank you very much, Ben. Yes, um, so the time, the question uh, going on the stream and you have a lot of questions. So uh, the first one is being the, uh, if it's possible to provide stakeholder with a listing of all validation, which is done by the UPD system, including the timing of the validation, when validating, when updating, when looking up operation outcome. So basically it's the business uh, rule engine, how, how it works. How, is it something we can provide, yes or no? Um, yes, okay. Uh, <laughs> If 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 um, I need to to clarify that um, if the question refers to the validations applied to the information that the marketing authorization holder need to provide to the UPD as part of um, it uh, looks like part, yep. Yep. yeah um, that set of rules is described already in uh, chapter seven uh, but if on the other hand the question refers to validations that the system makes on the create and update operations, please be aware that our current validations are aligned with the guidance provided either in chapter two or in chapter four. Chapter four was about the provision of legacy product data. Separate list of validations will not be provided because they would require additional resources, time and maintenance to be always in sync. In case um, the users um, believe that any of the validation rules are not correct or aligned with any of the aforementioned chapters, we recommend to contact the UPD SMEs. And you, as you know, we have SMEs both from the uh, industry side and from the national competent authority uh, site. Okay. Okay, I see that that question was also addressed in um, writing. Um, yep. Has a user experience specialist been consulted to place the procedure number field in the search option screen? Some search fields have been have moved due to this addition of uh, procedure number. Um, in at all stages, the subject matter experts from the uh, both from the industry and um, SME were consulted, and um, what was the way how it was um, designed and implemented, it was also uh, in close collaboration with uh, with the subject matter experts. Okay, thank you, Ben. And then we have also a question about the correct, um, if we can correct the figure in the UPD production banner. <laughs> if I post approximately 300 yes. entries. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, of course, and I'm glad that the colleagues that are monitoring the, the information that appears on the UPD banner and also those that are looking at the, uh, the data quality fr framework. Um, a dashboard in order to uh, deal with these um, non-current substances that we have in the in the UPD. Of course, we will update banner. We can commit to provide up-to-date um, information, and um, I'll, this is more with the place to thank also to the member states for their continuous work on the uh, improvement of the data quality into the UPD. I see another one. Can you demo the AMR reporting tool? And for, uh, okay, also the, even, okay, I need to clarify that the uh, antimicrobial, um, the, it's not the AMR reporting tool, it is the antimicrobial cells uh, and use reporting tool. 
is part of the monitoring value stream. There are another colleagues that are in charge of this task and I can ask them and uh, uh, the ASU will go, it's, should, will go live on the 29th of um, January. And I'm sure that uh, dedicated sessions are also um, scheduled. Okay. And then I think here we have a question about uh, communication of the new validations applied in the UPD. Okay. Um, <laughs> new, the new validations um, are always in consultation with um, uh, with the SMEs, we also pay particular attention on the impact of any new validation on the legacy products and updates of, of products and where there will be any impact. We try to provide information to the users via the UPD banner, release notes, um, dedicated sessions and email communication of, of course. Thank you. So thank you very much, Brian. And I think um, with that we are uh, coming to an end of uh, an end to this um, external um, system demo. And it's very nice to see how much work uh, has been done uh, during the last three months and uh, start to really pick up um, um, in terms of uh, delivering more and more features in our products. So I would like to to give you um, the next system demo date, which is the 26th of March 2024. And uh, I would like to wish you happy holiday and thanks to everybody who was participating to, to that system demo. And again, happy holiday and Merry Christmas to everyone. And see you soon.